If everyone could uh, take a seat, and, uh, and we'll get started. Welcome, everybody. And uh, anyone who is a, uh, a follower of my Pulse of Israel program, you will know that um, I'll give you the regular introduction. Welcome to the ancestral, biblical, beautiful homeland of the Jewish people, the land of Israel. In our ancestral, biblical, beautiful, biblical, and indivisible capital since King David's time. Some people might say, wait a second, that's so simple. Like, why is it so important that you say that? But no, so many Jews need to hear that themselves, just the simple truth about our story, about our reality, about the situation today. So yes, I make sure to say that each and every time I go live with a video. Let me introduce myself for those who are not familiar with me or my program. My name is Avi Abelo. Once upon a time, my partner and I, Avi Nadel, ran a very successful company with a website for Israel called the Israel Video Network, israelvideonetwork.com. We were one of the biggest websites in the Jewish Israel space, providing, since 2011, the politically incorrect truth about Israel. But the big tech gods, Google, Facebook, Twitter, all the rest, um, they didn't really like that. They didn't like the politically incorrect truth, which I basically told my partner when we started our business in 2011 that that day would come. And they basically destroyed our business overnight, just like that. From, half of, from achieving half a million video views a day, we went down to almost zero overnight. Just one example of the censorship that we had to deal with, and this is back in the year 2016, we're now 2023, and this was 2016, one of our Facebook pages with over half a million followers was deactivated because we posted an image that said it's called Israel, not Palestine. All right, this was 2016 before the censorship really went into high gear, but we knew it was coming, we were there. And this is what we've been dealing with since 2016. Today, I'm actually not as active on social media as I used to be. My company is, and, and, and 12 Tribe Films and 12 Tribe Films Foundation are also not as active on social media because me and all the work we do, our voices are one of the most censored voices about Israel on the internet today. That's what you get for trying to speak the politically incorrect truth. But I am a huge believer that everything is for the best, always for the best. If not having to start all over again, in a sense, we would have never launched the Pulse of Israel. And I wouldn't be standing in front of you here today with this very, very important initiative. So first of all, if anyone is not yet a subscriber to our Pulse of Israel daily video and podcast, now is a good time to, the, to go to the pulseofisrael.com website and click to subscribe because we are one of the voices out there trying to ensure that people do hear the politically incorrect truth, despite the uh, price paid for doing so. So why are we here tonight? Well, let me explain with a little story. Back in March, just a few months ago, I was speaking to a group in New Jersey. And in my talk, one of the points I gave across was how pained I was. This was... Um, after the three pairs of siblings were murdered over a two-month period, if I'm not mistaken. And I spoke to them how pained I was that this, this is happening and this is a reality that we're dealing with for, for decades. It's not, a, not, not new. And yet, where 
is uh, where are the voices of the leadership of the Jewish community? Because in a sense, the, the society, the environment, the Palestinian Authority, it's known there is the Taylor Force Act. The US government knows the Palestinian Authority gives money to terrorism, gets it to support terrorists. It knows about uh, all the wonderful work Itamar Marcus, who you're gonna hear tonight, talks about and gives over to Congress about the Palestinian Authority funded educational programs television programs teaching kids to hate Jews, to kill Jews, how to kill Jews. The US government knows this. And I, in my pain, I said, I'm, I'm really pained that the Jewish leadership are silent and not calling out the stoppage of funding, of US funding, to the Palestinian Authority. And everyone was in a sense nodding their heads. And then one guy raised his voice and he started screaming at me, very agitated. And he started saying, I'm on the board of this and this organization, I'm not gonna go there right now, but major Jewish organization, and we do so much for Israel, and we do this and we do that. And I, I let him get off his chest what he had to say. But I said, listen, everything you're saying is great and wonderful. I'm just referring to the silence that there is no voice. You're, you're, our brothers and sisters are being killed. We're, we're being attacked almost daily. And it's US money that's being used to fund this terror, genocidal war against us. And yet, the organizational Jewish world, including the organization you work with, are silent. But how, how can there be silence? And of course, he continued arguing for, uh, for a few minutes, but all, I didn't need to say anything because the other 50 people in the room, then they all of a sudden, they got it. And they were all basically arguing for me because they got it. Of course, he was in a, situation that he felt he had to defend himself being involved in one of these major organizations. But everyone else in the room got it. So why are we here tonight? We're here tonight because I'm very pained, like if not all of you, many of you, sad and mad, because in a sense, we are orphaned. We're orphaned, both from organizational leaders, not many of them, not all of them, politicians who allow this reality of a Jew-hating environment, society, to be around us day in and day out and treat it as normal and not do everything to scream to the heavens to stop it, to save our lives. That's why we're here tonight. Two very timely articles just came out, in a sense, pointing out the exact message that I'm trying to give across tonight with our program, with the really star-studded lineup we have that you are all going to hear from. Article number one, and someone's ears are gonna perk, is titled, Israel's American Frenemy, written by Melanie Phillips, who will be speaking here tonight. And the other one, titled, Giving Progressive Anti-Semites the Benefit of the Doubt, written by Jonathan Tobin, editor of JNS.org. And I, and I highly suggest everyone Google both of those, or not necessarily Google, go straight to the JNS.org website and read both of those articles and share them with everyone you can. So we are here tonight to highlight what many within our leadership, within the Jewish Israel sphere, are failing to do. And that is to simply call out the Jew-hating anti-Semitism that is behind the Palestinian national movement. So that all of us, all of us here tonight, all of us watching all over the world, and I'll tell you where everyone's watching from, can be empowered to bring about the much needed change to protect us all, not just here in Israel, but all over the world. You will hear critical information from our fabulous speakers tonight, and hopefully you will both leave confused and concerned about the following points, if not any others. Point number one, how can the US government pledge to fight anti-Semitism if it gives massive funding to the, if not the biggest, one of the biggest, anti-Semitic movements today that is behind both the Palestinian Authority and leadership and policy of UNRWA? That, leader, that literally fund the next generation of genocidal Jew haters, whether in Gaza, Judea and Samaria, 
within Israeli Arabs or all over the world via all, all their organizations. Where is the outrage today? I don't, I don't hear an outrage. That pains me. Hence we're here tonight. Point number two. How can the Jewish state of Israel fight anti-Semitism? If the state of Israel gives massive funding to, again, one of the biggest anti-Semitic movements today, the Palestinian Authority. Point number three. How are Jewish organizations and leaders protecting Jews around the world on college campuses or in the streets if they are silent about a very recent example of the problem? The United States government, including CARE, a Muslim Brotherhood organization that promotes Jew hatred as a partner in the US government's national plan to fight anti-Semitism. How? How, 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 and where, and where, again, where's the silence? And finally, another point, how is the Israeli government supposed to stop the terror against us in Israel by just targeting individual terrorists or even individual terror leaders yet ignore the need to put an end to the society and the infrastructure of Jew hatred created both under the Palestinian Authority and by Hamas, all with global funding. So to me, we're here tonight because I do not want those questions to be ignored any longer. I don't want Jews, whether in Israel, whether in America, whether in Canada, whether in Chile, whether in Mexico, whether in Spain, or many of the other countries watching here tonight, I want people to feel the sadness and to feel the madness so that it's us that brings the change necessary within our leaders to do what is necessary and say what is necessary to make the change to save our lives. Now, we at the 12 Tribe Films Foundation, with the Pulse of Israel program, in addition to everything else we do, we want these messages from tonight, from, again, the wonderful, amazing speakers we're going to have, we want them to reach hundreds of millions of people and millions of people so that, again, we can bring about the change necessary. It's not just about you sitting here listening, and it's not just about the people watching online wherever they are around the world. Now, let's get this conference started first with some inspiration, because again, the way I start my programs, and anyone who uh, knows me, well, or doesn't know me, the Pulse of Israel is about sharing the inspiring, politically incorrect truth about Israel, the Jewish people, and the freedom-loving world, uh, freedom world. So we're gonna start with the inspiration. And as I like to say, with it all, we are the most blessed generation of Jews in over 2,000 years. Finally sovereign in our ancestral homeland with our own IDF army able, with the ability to defend ourselves, whether it's always used properly or is a different question, but we have the ability to defend ourselves, something our ancestors could have only dreamt of. And this is a blessing we, can, we cannot take for granted and we have to say thank you for every single day. And with that, it's something inspiration. Yehudim, Am Yisrael, Shachachnu mi adachnu? Thank you. 
לנצח במלחמות ישראל. מלחמת השחרור, מלחמת ששת הימים, מלחמת יום כיפור. כל מלחמה ומלחמה, אנחנו ניצחנו. ואם היינו מפסידים אפילו מלחמה אחת, לא היינו כאן היום. אנחנו צריכים לזכות שהקדוש ברוך הוא איתנו, ולא משנה מה, אנחנו ננצח. למרות כל הסבל והכאב שאנחנו עוברים, אנחנו צריכים לזכור את ההיסטוריה שלנו. עם ישראל, תראו איפה אנחנו. האנטישמיות נמצאת בכל מקום. אנחנו צריכים להבין שאנחנו צריכים לעמוד על שלנו. אנחנו לא יכולים לסמוך על שאר העולם. אנחנו צריכים לעמוד על הערכים שלנו, על היהדות שלנו. להבין שלנו יש מדינה, ואנחנו בעל הבית. רק אז אנחנו נוכל לקום בבוקר. ובאמת, להפנים את זה. שאנחנו כבר לא צריכים לפחד, כי אתה יודע שאתה חי בביטחון. ואתה יודע שכל מה שאתה עשית, זה המקסימום שאתה יכול לתת בשביל המדינה שלך, בשביל העם שלך ובשביל היהדות שלך. בשביל היהדות והעם והמדינה של כולנו. תעריכו את זה. תעריכו את מה שיש לנו במדינה שלנו. תסתכלו איזה נוף מרהיב. האנשים... הים, המדבר, ירושלים בירתנו, אין מקום יותר קדוש מירושלים, איזה יופי, איזה מהמם, מדינת ישראל, אנחנו צריכים להעריך, להתעורר, להפנים, זה שלנו. ובשביל זה אנחנו צריכים לקום בבוקר ולהילחם. בשביל זה אנחנו צריכים לקחת את עצמנו ולהבין מה אני יכול לעשות כדי להבטיח שזאת תהיה המדינה שלנו. אנשים נלחמו, קידשו את נפשם בשביל שיהיה לנו מדינה. אנחנו צריכים להתאחד, להתחזק, להרבות שלום בכולם. תלכו למדינה שלכם, איפה שיש לכם את הרגל שלנו, תוציאו אותה בגלל. תניפו אותה בכל מקום. תהיו גאים במי ש... Besides being very happy that you are all here at this evening tonight and people all over the world are watching, um, a personal happiness and pride is my son made that. Before I introduce our first speaker, I just want to say a, a few thank yous at the start of this very important evening. First of all, a huge thank you to the one above for everything. Next, a big thank you to the donors who helped make this conference happen, to the sponsoring organizations, including the Yes Israel Project, Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights, Save the West, Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation, and Rabbi Kosberg's Matthias Project, and especially to all of you here today and watching online. And finally, a thank you to my parents. <laughs> For just being you. Now, to let you know, countries watching the live stream right now include people in Israel, United States, United Kingdom, Spain, Ireland, Canada, Czech Republic, South Africa, Scotland, Chile, Panama, Switzerland, Romania, Australia, Netherlands, France, Chile, Malta, Germany, Brazil, Sweden, Trinidad and Tobago, Philippines, Denmark, Ethiopia, Mexico, and this is just according to the registrations the last time I looked like at 10 o'clock this morning, and many, many more people have signed up since, so it could be many other people all around the world, but just know None of you are alone. We're all in this together, and we're all calling upon our leaders to wake up and provide the voice so necessary that we're all waiting for. Finally, a special thank you to my staff, and especially to Rachel Moore, who helped me put this conference together. And, and my sister, Shira, who as well helped everyone. 
And a final thank you to a huge friend and supporter who truly believes in the important work that I'm doing, that without his support, this event would not have happened at all, believe it or not, even though I haven't totally explained it to him, and that is a, a neighbor and a friend, Avram Deutsch. And anyone who needs any U.S.-Israel tax information, Avram is the man for you, and if you haven't made Aliyah yet and you're thinking about it, contact Avram, he'll help you with the taxes. Now, to begin with our first speaker, we have Itamar Marcus, the founder and director of Palestinian Media Watch, an Israeli NGO that studies Palestinian society by monitoring the Palestinian Authority's Arabic media and school books. PMW analyzes Palestinian Authority culture and society from numerous perspectives, including studies on summer camps, poetry, school books, religious ideology, and television. Since 1996, PMW reports have played a critical role in documenting the contradictions between the image the Palestinians present to the world in English and the messages to their own people in Arabic. Palestinian Media Watch research has been a key factor in understanding the Palestinian Authority. And right at this moment, or just little uh, moments before, a few days ago, he was presenting this exact presentation to Congress, which is a huge, huge step and good information. And that's why last minute he was not able to be here. So please put on the video. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank Pulse of Israel and thank Ali for this important initiative. I thank you very much for inviting me. With that, I want to apologize for not being here in person. I was invited to appear at a hearing in, in Congress in the Foreign Affairs Committee on the same topic of anti-Semitism. And that's why I'm very happy to air this recording in advance for you uh, so you can hear the message that I want to give. Palestinian Authority anti-Semitism is not a collection of isolated examples of hate speech. It is a fundamental part of their ideology. It is systematically expressed and disseminated from the leadership uh, and through all the frameworks the Palestinian Authority controls. There are two major parts of Palestinian Authority uh, anti-Semitism, one being its political anti-Semitism and the other being its religious anti-Semitism. Palestinian Authority political anti-Semitism has a number of components. First, the Jews inherently are evil uh, and threaten all of humanity, endanger all of humanity. Two, for this reason, the Jews brought anti-Semitism and hatred on themselves. And finally, uh, the Europeans decided to solve their Jewish problem by creating, by getting rid of their Jews, by stealing Palestine, sending the Jews there, and creating uh, a Zionist state. Uh, according to this ideology, the entire Zionist movement was initially a European movement in order to get rid of, get rid of the Jews. Now, listen to this in their own words. This is an interview with a researcher that PATV thought was important to broadcast three times already in 2020. <laughs> الأوروبيون كرهوهم وأرادوا التخلص منهم فكانت إحدى مصالح الدول الأوروبية تخلص من اليهود فبدأت فكرة قادة الدولة اليهود وفكرهم قائم على عنصرية جعلتهم مكروهين في أي مكان فكر الصهيوني قائم على أنهم شعب الله مختار في بروتوكولات حكماء الصهيون <تصفيق> the Jewish racism, the Jewish arrogance, Jews were hated everywhere, and the nations of the world wanted to create a state in order to get rid of Jews. Now, here's something that Fatah produced. This is an educational documentary that Fatah produced. Listen to the messages that Fatah is telling the people about the Jews. على الانفكاك عن البشر غرورا وشمئزازا من أغيار لا يرتقون إلى مكانتهم من أناس هم أفاع أبناء أفاع حسب رؤيتهم هناك تحاك كل مؤامرات الاستغلال المادي والأشهر للغير ويكره سكان الأرض جيتوهات القوم ومخازن تصدير الحقد والاستغلال <تصفيق> Jews were hated, they would have warehouses of hate and exploitation. Jews were hated because of the way we were. These are the messages coming from the PA and from Fatah to their people 
other quotes in this documentary about the Jews, the Jewish tribe, the, the project to enslave humanities, the Jews aligned with the Nazis to accumulate wealth. Uh, the Jews say only we are people, others are animals. But the key is, Jews were hated because of their racism and filthy behavior. The Jews brought anti-Semitism on themselves. They deserve to be hated. This is the message from the PA. And it comes from the South. Here's Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, he appeared um, uh, at, at numerous times. He's talked about this, but here's one of the times where he said that the Jews suffered 10 centuries of massacres uh, and the Holocaust. And what caused it? It was their social role, the usury, banks, etc. So 10 centuries of massacres, according to Mahmoud Abbas, uh, including the Holocaust, we brought on ourselves because of our social role. This is, see, it's coming from the top of the Palestinian Authority and getting down their way. Now here is a very good expression of this, uh, of the, 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 the summarizes the, this entire aspect of Palestinian ideology. كان اليهود بيزدادوا نفوذهم سواء في بريطانيا أو في سائر أوروبا كانوا مكروهين بشكل عام من من الشعب فكان لازم إنهم يخلصوا منهم ولكن بطريقة تتوافق مع مصالح بريطانيا بأنه هم in their homeland. This is where the idea of Israel being a colonial implant, a settler colonialism comes from, comes from this ideology. And we can see it's said from all different parts of Palestinian society and disseminated uh, on their television to, to the masses as well. Now, there are other parts of anti-Semitism and other libels. I want to just give you two examples of this, just to give you a sense of how evil this is very current. This is just earlier this month. وانا بس بستذكر ايضا مهم جدا الهولوكوست المفتعل المفتعل حقيقه وانا وانا زرت ذلك المكان وشفت فيلم وثائقي بانه كان تنسيق بين هتلر وبين الحرب الصهيونيه ليقوموا ادعاء هتلر uh, all of these things which we thought were history, everybody, but this is continuing today currently on the Palestinian Authority uh, official, uh, official uh, media uh, and disseminated to the people. Now, another example just recently uh, made on Palestinian TV. وانا اريد ان اذكر بما كنا بالمجكومه كولدا مير احدى مقولات التسعه الشريره وهذا انا اتمنى ان اصبح يوما وانا اجد Of course Golda Meir never said this the purpose of all of this demonization the Jews threaten Palestinians the Jews threaten Arabs the Jews threaten Muslims the Jews threaten the whole world this is the message coming from the Palestinians to the people we have a right to hate the Jews because everybody hates the Jews. That's the message uh, that comes across. Now, one example of this, it continues to today. It's not just history the Palestinians are talking about. Here we have uh, on Palestinian TV in January this year, but it's all the time. Uh, we are defending the honor of all humanity against the neo-Nazism that does not stop at the borders of Palestine, but threatens the international peace at all levels. The Jews threaten international peace at all levels. We threaten everyone. Um, this is the message from the PA to their people. And like I say, this threat of Judaism continues until today. I want to end with Mahmoud Abbas at the United Nations um, last month. He said many hateful things. Most of them uh, were missed by the international community. And this is the one I'm going to focus on. This particular ideology, look at what he said. Exactly this message which I'm telling. In Britannia, and the United States, the President of the United States, and 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 the President of the United
of the Palestinian Authority ideology. That's what the State of Israel is now. How effective has this political anti-Semitism been by the Palestinian Authority? Uh, it's been unbelievably effective. Look at this. This is a poll taken by ADL. It was a poll in 2014, but I'm sure it's even worse today. Palestinians and, and others were asked, um, true or false, people hate Jews because of the way Jews behave. And look what Palestinians are into. 87% of Palestinians said it's probably true. Jews are hated because of the way they behave. So see here the input and the output. See the message of the Palestinian Authority to the people, and we see how this is impacted on the Palestinian Authority. Not only we Palestinians hate them, but everybody hates them. Now, we also see that these messages of the PA are becoming part of the fundamental part of international anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism around the world. I'll give you one example. City University Law School graduation uh, last month, or this month. Uh, Fatima Muhammad spoke there and made a lot of noise. She talked a lot of hate speech, but the important thing I want to stress is Israel is a project of settler colonialism. What does that mean? It's exactly what you're hearing. It was the Europeans who decided to create Israel. The Jews have no history in the land. They would have never gone there, but it was the Europeans who decided to create a colony uh, in Palestine. Now, this brings us to the religious anti-Semitism, which really um, gives, I would say, Allah's stamp of approval for hating Jews. It's not just politically something you think about, but this is something that, um, that, that Islam is telling you to do as well, and that's why this is so important. This person you're going to hear now is the most important religious leader in the PA, Mahmoud al-Abbas, Abbas's advisor on Islam and head of the Sharia. عدنا هذه الواجبات على الأقل اللزام حتى لا يبقى نهبا لقطعان سائمة من أشباه البشر من أناس أو مخلوقات خلق الله على هيئة البشر هؤلاء من لعنهم جيوز are cursed جيوز are subhuman or actually humanoid Allah created us in the form of humans, uh, but we are actually descendants of ancient days. This is coming from the top religious figure from the Palestinian Authority. If you kill a Jew, you're not even killing a human being. That's what he's telling you. Beyond this, at different times, he's come out and said explicitly why you have an obligation to kill Jews. Listen to him on Palestinian TV quoting from the Quran. <laughs> ولا تعتدوا ان الله لا يحب المعتدين واقتلوهم المعتدين او اقتلوهم. Okay, Allah doesn't like the transgressors, therefore they should be killed. Now, who are these transgressors? Then he, he, stress, he specifies people who take your home, your land, your property, your honor, a whole list, 10 items uh, or 10 groups of people who deserve to be killed. All of these are accusations that he says, and they all say regularly about Israel. And we took their homeland, we took their rights. They say this all the time, and here he's giving the Quran's stamp of approval. God doesn't like them. He says, kill them. That's what he said on the TV. And at the end, he, he even quoted another source from the Quran uh, kill them wherever you find them. Whatever you find, you bring them to the land, you kill them. This is what he's telling Palestinians. This is the top religious figure, not Hamas. This is the top figure in the Palestinian, Palestinian Authority. The Mufti of the Palestinian Authority also corroborated this message. Uh, Sharia obligates the Muslims to wage jihad against the heathen Jews because they took their land. Same message is coming from all the top of the religious leaders. And then we get this as well on Pre TV. Allah delight us with the extermination of the evil Jews. Extermination. It's not just fight them, it's exterminate them, save the world from the problem of the Jews. That's the message. The world will be better off without the Jews. At the end of time, there will be no Jews. It's the Muslims' obligation to fight and exterminate the Jews. And of course, it's not just Jews. It's the evil Jews. The Jews deserve it because they are so evil. Now, how effective is Palestinian Authority anti-Semitism? I showed you before that one poll question. But in total, this is the continuation of that poll. Palestinians were the most anti-Semitic population in the world, according to the ADL poll. 93% of Palestinians who answered probably true to the majority of the anti-Semitic 
They're worse than Iraq, Yemen, Algeria, Libya. They're worse than the world. Palestinians are already are the most anti-Semitic population because of the teachings of the Christian faith. Now, what's the result of this? The result of all of this is that Palestinians really, truly believe it's the right thing to do to kill Israelis, even civilians, and I want to give you examples of this. First, earlier this year, two terrorists, two murdered Israelis, were released from prison. Abbas murdered an Israeli soldier only uh, 40 years ago. They were released because they were serving only 40 years. And Abbas called one of them the day he was released. أنت وكريم قامات كبيرة بالشعب الفلسطيني نفتخر فيكم وبنعتز فيكم وبنقول الله يعطيكم الصحة وأنتم نبراس. Okay, it, it, it's just not imaginable. Here's Mahmoud Abbas, who's supposed to be the moderate, telling these murderers that you are role models of this nation, models of the people, icons of the Palestinian people. Why? Because they did a cold blooded murder. Of, of Israeli. And the final example I'll give you is just the example of the, the recent tragic murder of Lucy, uh, Maya, and Rina D. Um, it shocked everyone in Israel, it shocked many people around the world. But how does the Palestinian Authority feel about this? Well, when Israel killed the terrorists who did it a month later, the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority, Mohammed uh, Shtaya, put the pictures of the terrorist murderers on his Facebook page and he wrote, glory and eternity to our righteous martyrs. Righteous, the murder of these three women was a righteous deed according to the Prime Minister of the Palestine Authority. Fatah uh, on the Telegram account put the pictures of the two terrorists and they quote the heroic jihad fighters. This is heroic, killing three innocent women, uh, civilians, uh, without any defense is heroic according to the Palestinian Authority and it's righteous according to the Prime Minister. Why? If you understand the anti-Semitism, understand this is what they believe God wants them to do, that's the only way to understand this. So what we're seeing is that Palestinian Authority anti-Semitism absolutely plays a fundamental message in the PA. It demonizes Jews, it demonizes Israelis, the entire world hates them, not just us. We have to clear the world and Allah wants us to well, therefore, even the killing of civilians is considered to be righteous uh, and, and heroic according to the Palestinian Authority. Anyone who would like a copy of this presentation, please write to us and I will send it to you. Thank you. So again, it boggles my mind how all this information is out there. I imagine Israeli government officials know this very well. American government officials know this, or at least some of them, European government officials, and yet this information is totally ignored. Totally ignored. And we're, we're the ones who pay the price. And just to give another also recent example, following up with what Itamar just said, um, I want to show you this short clip that um, some of you might have seen, if not all of you, but it's still so important and I want everyone around the world to see it. Uh, and it's a clip that I helped put together to get to de uh, to put together together with David Bedeen, who also does amazing, amazing work exposing all of this information. So please.
ולשאול אותם בעצם שתי שאלות. אחד, מה הם חשבו שהם ישיגו מהפעולה הזאת? ושנית כל, מה החזון הסופי שלהם לעולם, לעולם לשיפור, איך הם רוצים לשפר את העולם ומה שהם עשו? שלום לדיון, רק על המג'נדדר אלי, המג'נדדר אלי, עמלו פיהם ותחפוהם, בעת מה שחלו, וחרואי רגשי לעשות. אז אכל רק, אכל רק בביטחי, זה המג'נדדר, אז היה אכל רק, אכל רק, אכל רק תשמעו. Many of you have seen that video or not? The, the footage from from the funerals from the parents actually taken by staff hired by David Bedin. Unbelievable! This is really critical work he does. And again, you're, you're seeing the mother, the father, the child. That's the society. That's what we live with. That's what's ignored by too many of the people we're supposed to be looking up to to be protecting us. Now I want to introduce to you. A powerful voice of truth and reason, someone who I am blessed to both call a friend and to have had the opportunity to do many programs with, Melanie Phillips. <laughs> Melanie is a journalist, broadcaster, and author, is Britain's best known and most controversial champion of traditional values in the culture war. Her weekly column, which currently appears in the Times of London, has been published over the years in The Guardian, Observer, Sunday Times, and Daily Mail. She also writes for the Jewish News Syndicate, is a regular panelist on BBC Radio's The Moral Maze, and speaks on public platforms throughout the English-speaking world. Her first novel, The Legacy, which deals with conflicted Jewish identity, anti-Semitism, and the power of history, was published in 2018 along with her personal and political memoir, Guardian Angel. Her previous books include her 2006 bestseller, bestseller Londonistan, about the British establishment's capitulation to Islamist aggression, and The World Turned Upside Down, The Global Battle Over God, Truth, and Power, published in 2010. Everyone can follow Melanie's work at her website, melaniephillips.substack.com. With that, please, Melanie. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Erev Tov. Thank you very much indeed, Avi. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here this evening to speak about this very important topic and to follow the incredibly sobering and terrifying presentation by Itamar Marcus. Those of you, uh, if, there are, if, if there's anybody here who's never seen or read the stuff that he produces on Palestinian Media Watch, um, it will have come as a tremendous shock 
It doesn't shock me because I read it virtually every day, and yet it does shock me every single day, the depths of evil that one is facing there. So it begs the question, it provokes the question that we're all here really this evening to discuss. Because for years, uh, those of us who support Israel have asked why its case has never been put effectively in the world. Why it is that the false and murderous Palestinian Arab narrative is accepted by so many as true. And people also ask why the diaspora is now experiencing a tsunami of anti-Semitism throughout the West. And the answer to both those questions is a failure of collective Jewish leadership, both in Israel and in the diaspora. Now, currently, there's great concern about the Biden administration in the United States. It continues to support and incentivize the Palestinian Authority while diminishing the severity of Palestinian Arab attacks on Israelis. It continues to restrain Israel from building homes for Israeli residents in the disputed territories of Judea and Samaria, and it continues to try to empower Iran. Only today I was reading that the Biden administration has now reinstituted the boycott of Israeli companies in the disputed territories. I called it, as Avi has referred already in my most recent piece uh, for the Jewish News Syndicate, I refer to the United States as something that we should now regard as a frenemy. Uh, Israel benefits from association with the United States, the United States benefits from association with Israel, but the Biden administration is a hostile entity now and should be regarded as such. Now, why are there... Why has this situation arisen? Why does the Biden administration think like this? Why do progressive people throughout the West think like this? Well, there are many reasons. There are specific ideologies at play on the left, um, the uh, narrative that the left tells itself about the West being mired in the original sin of colonialism, and for this purpose, Israel is part of the West. In America, as you may know, the majority of American Jews vote Democrat, and the Democratic Party has slid towards quite overt Jew hatred and Israel hatred. And throughout the diaspora, particularly in Britain, where I come from, uh, diaspora Jews really just want to fit in and keep their heads down and don't want to rock the boat. And I'm afraid, especially in, Bri in Britain, they grovel to those in power. But the problem that I am discussing goes, has at its roots something which goes back a long, long way, far, far before the Biden administration, and even among um, American administrations that have been sympathetic to Israel. Because successive American administrations have perpetuated the delusion that the Middle East conflict, so-called, is a dispute over territorial boundaries between two sides, each with a legitimate claim to the land. Even George W. Bush, the president who was so remarkably friendly and well disposed towards Israel, even George Bush said the Palestinians were entitled to a state of their own. Well, if they ever were entitled to a state of their own, surely after their behavior for the best part of a century, that entitlement is now forfeit in any decent world. And in any event, in any event, they never were entitled in the first place because the idea of their entitlement totally ignores the fact that only the Jewish people are entitled to this land in its entirety as dictated by history and as enshrined in international treaty obligations and other instruments of international law which pertain today, which date back to the 20, 1920s. This fundamental error of perception is the reason why Israeli residents of the disputed territories are excoriated as illegal settlers who are preventing a two-state solution to the conflict. In fact, as we know, the Arabs have been trying to exterminate Jewish residency in the entire land of Israel for the past century, decades before the 1967 Six-Day War liberated Judea and Samaria from illegal Jordanian occupation. 
Now, the progressive world simply cannot and will not admit that they have got this so completely wrong. They cannot and will not admit that this conflict is anything other than a dispute over land boundaries between two sets of people entitled to the same patch of territory. And this is in part because of the liberal fantasy that all conflicts involve rational actors and therefore all conflicts can be solved by negotiated compromise. Well, it's not a situation that requires a negotiated compromise, and negotiated compromise would be the end of Israel. Israel, unsurprisingly, does not wish itself to be exterminated. Since Israel resists the attempt to exterminate it, the Biden administration and much of the West regard Israel as the problem, since they have conceived the problem as one which must have a negotiated compromise between two entitled parties. So it punishes Israel while rewarding Israel's attackers. And this mistake over the roots of the conflict are not just a mistake that dogs administrations of different persuasions. It's not just a mistake which informs appalling prejudice and attacks against Israel and against the Jewish people. It's actually much more fundamental. This mistake made by the West is the reason why this conflict continues without end. This mistake was first made in the 1930s by Britain, which then held the mandate for Palestine, under which it was bound by international treaty to settle the Jews throughout what is now the state of Israel, the disputed territories, and Gaza. And in the 1930s, Britain reneged on that, on that obligation by offering part of the Jews' entitlement to the land to the Arabs in response to their attempts to exterminate the Jewish presence altogether. In other words, it was a concession designed to reward terror at the expense of its victims. It's not rocket science. If you reward terror at the expense of its victims, you get not peace, but more terror as terrorists and their backers realize that all they have to do is ramp up the violence, and the more they ramp it up, the more concessions they will get. And that has been the case in the Middle East at the hands of first Britain, then Europe and America, since then, since the middle of the last century. And yet, with varying degrees of virulence, this is the progressive narrative throughout the West. Now, in my view, Israeli and Jewish leaders need to say very clearly and very frequently that history shows that the Jews alone are entitled to the land, that Israel has international law on its side. Many, many people in Britain, and I'm sure elsewhere, believe that the only reason the Jews think they're entitled to the land is because of the Bible and who believes in the Bible. They have absolutely no idea that there was actually a historical reality of a Jewish kingdom in this, in this land, and that the Jews are the only people for whom this land has been their national kingdom as a people. So why don't Israeli and Jewish leaders say this? Well, in the diaspora they don't say it, because many Jews in the diaspora don't actually believe it. They don't actually believe that the Jews alone have the rights to this land even some of those Jews who have homes here and who consider themselves Zionists. Israel doesn't say it for a number of reasons. First of all, in my view, from what I have seen and heard over the years, Israelis at the highest level do not understand the roots of the Western mistake about Israel, and they do not understand or appreciate the depths of the dislike disdain and hatred for Israel. In Britain, I see diplomats arrive who have been prepped about British anti-Semitism, and they are shocked. They have absolutely no idea what has then hit them. So Israelis don't understand what they're up against. 
They don't want to open what they consider to be, and I've heard this said to me, a can of worms. What do they mean by a can of worms? Well, I think they mean, well, we kind of went along with Oslo. And how can we now turn around and say, actually, they really just want to kill us all? They can't. Well, in fact, they can, but they won't. So that's a problem. Then they have other more pressing issues on their plate. Well, who can not sympathize with that? They've got Iran, they've got Hezbollah, they've got the Hamas, they've got Palestinian Islamic Jihad. I mean, why do they want to have their heads filled with all this problem about what people think in the West? I get that, but it's wrong. And finally, and the most tragic reason, in my view, is that they say, what, you think that we're going to persuade anybody in Britain after what they did to us in Palestine? What, you think we're going to persuade anybody in Europe, the graveyard of our people? Anti-Semitism is endemic in the West. There is absolutely no point whatsoever in our trying to say anything at all. I don't know about Europe, but I do know about Britain. And I'm absolutely confident, I have said this to these people in the past, these Israelis who say this, I have said that if you were to make the case properly, the dynamic, the political atmosphere, atmospheric dynamic in Britain would change overnight to which the Israelis say, Britain, you don't know what you're talking about. Okay. The fact is, it's very hard indeed, for diaspora Jews to be more Zionist than the Israelis. And there's another important omission as well, and this touches on the presentation by Itamar. Through a combination of ignorance and fear, Jewish leadership in the diaspora and in Israel refuses to call attention to the fact that the Muslim world is an engine of Jew hatred in the West. They fail to tell people that the Palestinian Authority the supposedly moderate partners for peace who we are told are entitled to a state of their own. They fail to tell people that the PA pumps out Nazi and medieval-themed genocidal incitement against Jews as Jews every single day, as we have just heard. People in the West believe that Islamic Jew hatred is the result of Israel's occupation. But of course, this long predated the very existence of the State of Israel, let alone the so-called occupation after 1967. In the 1920s, the then Grand Mufti's call to arms against the Jews, which ignited pogroms in this land, was to defend Al-Aqsa against the Jews' supposed aim of destroying it, the very same claim made by Mahmoud Abbas today. Islam holds that once Muslims control a piece of territory, it is always Muslim, it is sacred to Islam, and it cannot be ruled by anyone else. Ridding that territory of interlopers, so-called, is perceived as a holy war. As Itamar has implied, they, are, they consider that they are doing the work of God himself. Clearly, this is not a land dispute. Clearly. This is the crucial core of the reason for the undying war against Israel. Yet, the Jewish world fails to say this. Israel fails to say it. It prefers to present what's going on as a war for land, even an extermination over land. It doesn't say what lies behind that war for the entire land. Once upon a time, I was told by an Israeli who I said, I don't understand why Israel doesn't go on about this the whole time. I mean, it's basically the same thing that the West is facing, that Israel is up against it, you know, in its face, as it were. Uh, Islamic fundamentalism, fanaticism, religious fanaticism, jihad, holy war. Why don't you say it, I said to this person. And he said, are you crazy? It would be far, far too frightening for us to believe that we were up against 1.6 billion Muslims. And I said, well, of course it's terrifying, but do you really think that if you deny what you're up against, you're gonna win? To which, of course, there was no answer except, you really don't understand how difficult this all is. Nor do Israeli leaders tell the world of the genocidal incitement pumped out by the PA. Israeli leaders make very little use of Itamar Marcus's PMW resources. Rarely, if ever, 
do they draw attention to the theological roots of Palestinian and Muslim Jew hatred. In the diaspora, in Britain, Jewish leaders never mention PA anti-Semitism. They never also mention the disproportionate involvement by Muslims in attacks on diaspora Jews in Britain and elsewhere. As a result of this silence, the embrace of the Palestinian narrative of Jew hatred has had an enormous effect in making anti-Semitism on the left respectable. And yet, in Britain, if one draws attention to this terrible fact, one is called by the Jewish community leadership Islamophobic. Now, failure to utter these truths has meant that the Jewish leadership in both Israel and the diaspora has allowed the enemy to set the terms of the argument. It makes us all play defense, and playing defense always is to lose the argument before it even starts, because you are arguing on territory dictated by the enemy. Playing defense is foolish. We need to get off this back foot and go onto the front foot, not responding to the lies, not saying, why are you being so beastly to us, we're the victims here. No, 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 that's, that's playing on the territory dictated by the enemy, and it's to lose the argument before it even starts. What the Jewish world should be doing is proactively taking the enemy down. We must do this by educating the ignorant on the one hand and on the other, delegitimizing the malevolent. What do I mean? Well, there should be a strategy for educating the ignorant public. I believe there is considerable room for improvement in the public attitude by simply telling them facts of which they have absolutely no idea such as Israel's legal, historic claim to the land as validated by the international community. We need to show that Israel has justice and truth on its side. In Britain, I don't know about anywhere else, but in Britain that really matters. They believe that Israel is on the wrong side of justice and law. If they were shown that Israel is on the right side of justice and law, it would create at the very least a discussion. At the very least, people would start to think, oh, there's another side. And that's at the very least. We should be talking about the ethnic cleansing of Jews from Arab lands. We should be using phrases all the time like Jewish refugees. We should be reclaiming the language from the hijack that's taken place. We should be talking about Arab colonialism. Whenever we say the word colonialism, we should preface it by the word Arab. It's not us who's being the colonialists, it's them. We should talk about the brutality of Palestinians to Palestinians, the jailing of their journalists, the killing of their homosexuals, the treatment that they inflict, inflict upon women and girls. We should be setting out how Israel is so vital for Western interests. What would happen to the West if Israel were to lose, if Israel were to disappear? We should be calling out our enemies by name, both governments, including our so-called friendly governments, and individuals. We should be asking why Britain and America have uniquely incentivized aggression, murderous aggression, by rewarding, ignoring, and sanitizing it. Why the West is forcing Israel to negotiate with those who teach their children to hate and to murder Jews as Jews. We should be accusing the West for appeasing fanatics and thereby promoting terrorism, causing the Middle Eastern impasse and the murder of countless Israelis. We should be asking why the West is silent over the anti-Semitism rampant in the Muslim world by the Palestinians and in more generally in the Muslim world. We should be asking why the United States, the United Kingdom, and the European Union are active accessories to this incitement by funding the Palestinian Authority, giving them the money to teach their children to hate and to murder. We should be asking why the world still invests the United Nations with any authority when it is actually a mechanism for empowering dictatorships and rogue states. We should be reclaiming we should be reclaiming the word Zionist for the moral high ground. We should be teaching people that Zionism is simply Jewish self-determination. We should be teaching people who really think that Judaism is just a religion and 
why does a why does a religion have a claim to a piece of land? I mean, people in Britain just really don't get this. So we should be teaching them that Judaism consists of a kind of three-legged stool, the people, the book, and the land. And these are inseparable. It doesn't mean you've got to be a Zionist to be a Jew. It doesn't mean you have to be observant to be a Jew. But it does mean if you knock away any of these legs, Judaism disintegrates. And to be hostile to Israel or to Zionism is therefore to be hostile to Judaism. We need to show that to be anti-Israel is to be anti-Jew, that to be anti-Israel has the same unique qualities, the same unique properties as anti-Semitism throughout the ages, and how anti-Israelism has made Jew hatred respectable. We need to say loud and clear that anti-Semitism is not the equivalent of Islamophobia, that the claim of Islamophobia is weaponized to launder anti-Semitism. We need to say why anti-Semitism is unique. Now, would any of this have any effect? Because people are very skeptical. It's all too big, it's all too overwhelming, we can't do much. Well, I think this overlooks one weapon at our disposal, and that weapon is what I would call the Achilles heel of the Western progressive. The Western progressive does not care about the people that the Western progressive says they care about. They don't care about the wretched Palestinians. If they did, they would be campaigning every day against the Palestinian Authority for what it's doing to its own people. They don't care about women in the Muslim world or any of these causes. What they care about is not so-called victims of oppression, but they care about their own image to themselves and to others as being moral, decent, and above all, highly intelligent, smart. That's what they care about, and that is their weakness. We need to focus on this Achilles heel, their narcissistic self-regard as people of conscience and as people of intelligence, and we need to show that they are neither that they are the opposite of those things. We need to ask in terms and by name why they are supporting those who oppress women, why they are supporting those who lock up their political opponents, why they are supporting those who throw gay people off the top of high buildings. We should be asking these supposed progressives why they are backing racist ethnic cleansing in a future state of Palestine. They accuse us of ethnic cleansing. We know this is completely ludicrous. Out to lunch. Throw the accusation back at them on the basis of truth. The Palestinian Authority and others in the Palestinian cause tell us not one Jew in Palestine. Not one Jew. Now, Western progressives don't know this. If they know it, they don't register it. They don't process it. So they have to be asked. Why are you backing ethnic cleansing in a future state of Palestine? I can tell you what happens one-on-one -on -one when I have said this to people who think like this. They recoil. They can't process it. They say, what are you talking about? They have no idea what I mean, so I spell it out. And then they say, no, 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 no. That's not what, that's not what they say at all. By national state, this and that. And you, you drill down and you say, this is what they've said, this is what Mahmoud Abbas has said, and then they fall silent and they change the subject and you're no longer the most popular person in the room. <laughs> so we have to educate the uneducated, delegitimize the delegitimizers, and position Israel at the forefront of the global battle for civilization. In my view, such an approach would instantly alter the dynamic of Israel fashion. Many people just don't know what they don't know. And one may say, well, this is not going to have much effect. But it is much, much harder to lie when the truth is out there. In conclusion, we have lost the battle because we have never, ever had a coherent strategy to match that of the other side. The other side has poured over decades millions, possibly billions of dollars into seeding the lie, the big lie, throughout the credulous intelligentsia of the West. They have 
deployed every possible, every conceivable weapon in the armory of public relations, propaganda, whatever you like to call it, and they have succeeded. And meanwhile, uh, we have been bleating, why are you being so horrible to us? We have never had a strategy. It's unbelievable, but we have never had a strategy to counter this. Those responsible for funding and inciting fanaticism have never been held to account for what they have done, and they are, as a result, continuing to do so. I believe it is high time for this to change and to hold our leadership's feet to the fire. Thank you very much. Melanie Phillips, everybody, one of the very powerful and necessary voices, not just for the Jewish people, but for the freedom-loving world today. Before I introduce the next, also just as powerful voice, I just want to share a short story, personal story, that highlights the truth, the truths that are, that are totally ignored. Anyone here familiar with the IDF program called Native? Native? Okay, Native is the IDF conversion program where when soldiers who are not Jewish according to Israel, uh, Jewish law have the opportunity to convert and go through a conversion process while they're serving in the IDF. So my wife and I and our, and our children uh, every few months, at least before COVID, we used to host Nativ um, IDF soldiers at our home for Shabbat to give them the Shabbat experience. So usually most of the IDF soldiers, part of the Nativ program, are either Russian or Ukrainian. 99.9% .9 of the time, we always go around the table and we ask their names, what their stories are, etc. One Friday night, we were going around the table, Maxim, Igor, whatever, and then one guy says his name is Muhammad. I'm like, whoa, okay, Muhammad, what's What's your story? Where are you from? And again, I'm expecting, okay, an Israeli Arab, for whatever reason, wants to convert. Amazing, right? He's from Gaza. I'm like, okay, wait a second. I've got to take a step back here. Why, at our Shabbat table, do we have a Muslim from Gaza who's not only serving in the IDF, but converting to be a Jew? I'm like, Mahabit, tell us your story. And he said the following. His father was an employee of the Palestinian Authority in Gaza. He and his three brothers, there were four brothers, all grew up in Gaza. The year 2007 came around, and anyone familiar with modern Israeli history, unfortunately, after the state of Israel expelled the 10,000 Jews and destroyed the 21 Jewish communities, well, in 2000, and that was in 2005, in 2007, Hamas had a military coup against the Palestinian Authority. And the Hamas basically were throwing Palestinian Authority officials off of roofs, killing them, hunting them down in the streets, etc., etc. So Muhammad's father, his life was in danger. And he understood that Hamas was trouble for, the Gaza, for, for Gaza and for the Arabs in Gaza. So he secretly helped Israel and the IDF, like giving targets and information. So his life was even more in danger and, the, and their whole family's lives were in danger. So the state of Israel, again, things that don't get told in the media, uh, secretly uh, saved and snuck Muhammad, his siblings, his father and, mo and mother into Israel, gave them Israeli citizenship as a thank you for helping Israel in fighting Hamas. Okay? And in a sense, we saved their lives. So Muhammad said, as a thank you to the Jewish state of Israel, he is the youngest of four brothers. All four of them served in the Israeli army, right? They realized all their lives they were taught that, is, that Jews are evil, that Jews want to kill them. And in real time, they got to experience reality that the ones who wanted to kill them were their own brothers, cousins, neighbors in Gaza, their fellow Arab Muslims. And it was the Jews, the Jewish state of Israel who saved their lives. So I'm like, okay, wonderful, Muhammad. So you and your brother served in the Israeli army. Why are you converting to be a Jew? You don't have to do that. You can be an Israeli citizen, be an Arab, be a whatever. And he goes again, all three of my older brothers converted, and now I'm converting. 
And it's because we understood that everything we were taught all our lives in the name of Islam was a lie. And you, the Jewish people, care about life, care about living, care about our lives, and we want to be part of the Jewish people. And one of the most exciting phone calls I received in my life was the phone call from Muhammad when he passed his test of the rabbinate and officially became a Jew. And that, sure, please clap. And if you ask me, that little story encapsulates the reality of our situation here in the Middle East, that the establishment media ignores 110%, and that unfortunately our own Jewish leaders and Israeli leaders do not even take the time to tell in order to get this true story across about us, about our situation, about who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, etc. Now, to invite up the next powerful uh, speaker and columnist in our time, Caroline Glick. I imagine everybody knows Caroline. <laughs> senior contributing editor at JNS and a senior columnist at JNS and Newsweek. Also a diplomatic commentator at Israel's Channel 14. Caroline serves as Senior Fellow for Middle Eastern Affairs at the Center for Security Policy in Washington, D.C., and a lecturer at Israel's College of Statecraft in Jerusalem. She is the author of The Israeli Solution, A One-State Plan for Peace in the Middle East and Shackled Warrior, Israel and the Global Jihad. A widely sought-after lecturer, Caroline Glick has briefed policymakers from Washington to Canberra, military commanders in Israel and the U.S., and general, general audiences worldwide. She has received multiple awards for her journalism as a captain in the IDF from 1994 to 1996. Caroline was a core member of Israel's negotiating team with the PLO and served as assistant foreign policy advisor to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu from 1997 to 1998. She is the author of The Israeli Solution, and she lives in Efrat with her husband Shimon Suisa and their sons Yoav and Shiloh. Caroline, the stage is yours. hosting this very, very important conference, and I want to thank, uh, and the Pulse of Israel, and I want to thank all of you for coming and participating, both you guys here at the Begin Center and also all the people tuning in on Zoom. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I didn't think I was going to be able to come because uh, it's crazy conflicts in the, the schedule this afternoon, but I was able to do it, and so um, I want to... Um, I want to start with, with something that I found out recently. It didn't surprise me, but I think it encapsulates one of the biggest problems that we face uh, with the Palestinians and with Palestinian anti-Semitism uh, that, that goes sort of under almost everybody's radar. So the Palestinian Authority, which is the PLO, uh, it recently, in recent years, uh, established something that they call the Palestinian or the Palestine Heritage T uh, Trail. The Palestine Heritage Trail goes from south in Hebron to north in Shechem, Nablus, and um, it claims to be uh, exposing to those who walk it the history of ancient Palestinian civilization in the land of Palestine. And um, the thing that's so amazing, I mean, there are many, many things that are amazing about the, the concept of a Palestine heritage Trail. The first one is that it's completely nonsensical from both a topographical perspective and a complete fabrication from a perspective of human development uh, in the land of Israel over the last millennia. Because uh, as anybody who studies uh, human development in the Near East will show you that, uh, that peoples developed in this area uh, from west to east. And all of the development of human civilization in the area went from west, from the Mediterranean, up to the Sumerian mountain ridges and the South Hebron Hills. So that from a historical perspective and a topographical perspective, it's both nonsense and it's nonsensical and counter-historical. Um, one of the things that the Palestinians do on their trail is they destroy all of the markings of the 
um, trails to actual historical sites that Israel has developed over the past 100 years. Um, Any time that they see a rock that shows uh, go this way to the ancient site, uh, they throw it at the bottom of a wadi or whatever and they destroy. Uh, you can actually go through Judea and Samaria and you see that everywhere that the Palestinians control, they systematically annihilate the historical record by bulldozing uh, Jewish heritage sites. And really, um, anywhere that you go in the entire land of Israel, and certainly in Judea and Samaria, which are the cradle of Jewish civilization for the past 3,000 years, or 3,500 years from the time of Joshua, and even before that, in the time of Abraham, as we see in the cave of the matriarchs and the patriarchs of Hebron, every single square centimeter of this land, you just dig a few centimeters below the surface and you see artifacts attesting to Jewish history here. But nobody's ever found an ancient Palestinian coin anywhere, because there aren't any. And so you can see in the north, um, Joshua's altar, uh, which actually was proven uh, to be, in fact, the place that is described in the book of Devarim, the book of De- Deuteronomy, where Joshua uh, assembled the, the tribes of Israel um, and gave a burnt offering. All of this, you know, it was, um, it was excavated and it was shown that even carbon-14 dating of the altar showed that all of the bones were from the period of Joshua and that all of the bones were of kosher animals. Um, so that in every respect, uh, the biblical account was authenticated. Uh, the ancient uh, capital of uh, Samaria, of the, kingdom of, Samar- of the kingdom of Israel, Samaria, has been renamed Sebastia uh, by, the, by the Romans, of course, but the Palestinians are developing the ancient site of Sebastia as a Palestinian heritage site. They're wrecking all uh, all of the evidence of uh, the capital of ancient Israel deliberately, and by the way, with the support of the UN and uh, South Korea and other foreign governments that are funding and underwriting uh, the establishment of the Palestine Heritage Site at Sebastia. Um, and you see this all over Judea and Samaria, from north to south, from west to east. You see that the Palestinians, and of course we saw this in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, where they systematically Uh, sought to destroy the historical record of the temples in Jerusalem through whole-scale archaeological destruction, um, both when they excavated mosques there and also just uh, as an act of uh, historical terrorism against uh, really uh, one of the most important heritage sites in the entire world, because it's not only cradle of Judaism is the cradle of Christianity and the cradle of Islam. Um, But this is something that they do systematically to physically wipe out the historical record of the Jewish people, Jewish civilization. And then, as we see in in Samaria, as we see in Joseph's altar, which I forgot to mention, they're turning it into a barbecue site. Um, And every other uh, ancient, and in some cases, holy sites that they control, Um, They are taking action to physically wipe out the historical record and then appropriating those sites to a non-existent Palestinian heritage in the land of Israel. And, um, you know, we see this then in university campuses throughout the world where you have uh, Arab uh, and uh, and anti-Israel scholars of the Near East who insist that there's no record of Jewish civilization in the land of Israel, and also that today's Jews are not the descendants of the biblical Jews, um, even though there are simply mountains and mountains and mountains of historical evidence attesting to the fact that we are, in fact, the descendants of the people of Israel, not to mention genetic evidence from DNA testing over the years that show that all of the priests, for instance, have, all of the Kohanim have a, have a common um, uh, Y-DNA uh, strand and a common uh, paternal ancestor. So um, scientific medical evidence all attest to that. And the Palestinian narrative is based not only on an erasure of Jewish history, but also on the appropriation of that history to themselves. And I would argue, um, and then what I started to say was that Palestinian or supporting Palestinian 
uh, academics throughout the world then write uh, books uh, claiming that um, the truth of the Palestinian narrative and the mendaciousness of Jewish history. Um, and I, I would argue um, that this is the most uh, annihilatory Jew hatred we've, we've ever experienced. I mean, I, I think it, it, the, its antecedent was the Romans who wiped out the named Judea, Israel, replaced it with Palestine, re erased the name Jerusalem, replaced it with Aeolina Capitolina, with the intent of erasing the Jews from the pages of history. And, and what's interesting, and they also carried out a holocaust against the Jews of the Near East. Um, and uh, according to Josephus, they killed over a million Jews all over the land of Israel and then out and over to present day Libya. Um, at any rate, um, what we're seeing with the Palestinians is a reenactment, really, of Roman Jew hatred, and and, we, and, and I would argue that it's even uh, more annihilatory uh, than Nazi anti-Semitism, because Nazi anti-Semitism defined the Jews as a race, and it was directed specifically towards living Jews. They wished to wipe out the Jews who were alive from the face of the planet, and they did a pretty good job. They killed a third of us. But the Palestinians not only want to wipe out the Jewish people in the land of Israel, that's their declared goal, the annihilation of the Jewish state. Uh, they've been carrying out a uh, physical, violent uh, war against the Jews of the land of Israel for over 100 years. Um, but also, uh, they wish to erase Jewish history uh, from, from the pages, from the historical record both on the ground physically through the physical destruction of uh, antiquities and Jewish holy sites and also through fake academic research that uh, makes the incredible assertion that there's no connection between the Jews of Israel and the Jews of the world today and the Jews of the Bible. Um, so that this is really a much more degrading um, and, and eliminationist agenda even than that of the Nazis. And um, we've been losing the war about, against this annihilatory anti-Semitism for many, many reasons. One is because we don't even understand its implications. We think, well, they have a narrative, they're allowed a narrative, everybody has a narrative, and what we really have to do is just get together with their narrative versus our narrative and all is well in the world. But in fact, when you look at the nature of their narrative, their narrative cannot just as, as an existential matter ever coexist with the existence of Jewish people. Aside from that, um, and, and that's one of the main reasons. The other thing is that uh, particularly the Jews in the diaspora and specifically the Jews in the United States and for a while a plurality of Jews in Israel were taken in by this concept of a two-state paradigm. And that was really um, embraced as the uh, position of the government of Israel in 1993 with the advent of the uh, so-called Oslo peace process with the PLO. And um, the two-state narrative at its base uh, essentially says that the reason that there is a conflict between Israel and the Arab world at large and the reason that there's a conflict between the if the people of Israel, the Jews of Israel, and the Palestinian Arabs specifically is because Israel is too large. And that uh, what we really need is for Israel to yield territory that it controls, and the specific territory Israel is supposed to yield is the cradle of, civil, of Jewish history and civilization and religious faith, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, to the Palestinians who are their true owners. So when you look at the nature, the basic assumption of the two-state solution, so-called, you see that what it involves is a whole-scale adoption of the Palestinian appropriation of Jewish history and erasure of Jewish history from the land of Israel. So people who refer to Israel as colonialist occupiers or uh, Jewish community as settler colonialism, etc., what they're doing is they're embracing out of whole cloth this concept that we are not native to our native land, that our history uh, doesn't exist, and that their appropriation of our history is more legitimate than our actual history, which is why, I mean, among other things, you state that the 
Biden administration's uh, representative to the Palestinian Authority, the, the Palestinian Affairs Unit of the U.S. Embassy, which is which they're doing everything to present as an independent entity, despite the fact that it isn't a consulate. He runs around uh, Judea and Samaria with Palestinian Authority officials visiting ancient Palestinian heritage sites. So you 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 see you see that and its face the two-state narrative involves embracing the Palestinian narrative, which again is the erasure of Jewish history erasure of Jewish um, rights and the appropriation of that history and those rights to Palestinian Arabs. Um, and, and we don't, you know, we don't really think about that because we don't think it through. We want to get to yes, as they said at Harvard uh, negotiations pro program, or we want to, you know, we want to have peaceful coexistence, two states, a Palestinian state and the state of Israel's living side by side in peace, but we fail to recognize that that's simply impossible because the Palestinian story that they tell themselves involves a co-optation and, and an erasure of Jewish history. Um, so, so that's really, I think, the base of our issue here. Um, and I want to say, just on this subject, two more things. One is, you know, there's been a lot of talk about uh, increasing cleavage, increasing alienation between Israeli Jews and diaspora Jewry, and particularly American Jews. And it's all around the issue of the so-called two-state solution, that the overwhelming majority of American Jews support the division of the land, and they uh, believe, as J Street leader Jeremy Ben-Ami and Barack Obama have called for Israel to receive tough love from the United States, of course. I never really understood what the concept of tough love is other than wife abuse, but um, so, uh, and, I, and I think that, that we're seeing a lot of that these days um, from, from American Jewish leaders, unfortunately, because I don't think that they fundamentally understand the problem here. Um, and, and the problem here, as we're seeing with the BDS directed against Americans who support Israel on college campuses and corporate boardrooms and throughout really ever widening circles in the United States, um, seeks to demonize American Jews as Jews because they commit the unforgivable crime of supporting Israel. And um, on the other hand, you see uh, rising voices of American Jews who claim that they are anti-Zionist and that Zionism is actually a form of anti-Semitism because Real, you know, there's a, a Zionism, they've embraced this concept that Zionism is not inherent to Judaism, but rather that it is alien to Judaism and it's a colonialist uh, add on to the true Jewish character, which is tikkun olam, which is communism. And so you're seeing increasingly Jewish voices who are saying that Zionists are by their nature anti Semitic. So, Zionism is a form of racism, according to the Palestinians, and, Zion, and Judaism is anti-Zionism, so if you're pro-Palestinian, you're a good Jew, and you have to be anti-Semitic and anti-Israel. Anyway, it's all kind of a melange, but it all kinds of spins together. Because one of the things that the Jews in, in the diaspora, in, increasingly in the United States, but not only, don't recognize, is that they simply cannot explain themselves to themselves without Israel without Jerusalem, because Jerusalem has always been the center of Jewish identity. And this is why, of course, if you go into any synagogue throughout the world, whether it's in Timbuktu or Tashkent or Tennessee, you're always going to see the ark pointing towards Jerusalem, and you're always going to have a Torah scroll in there telling the story of a very particular people, our people, and their birth in the land of Israel their uh, enslavement in, in Exodus and their journey in the wilderness for 40 years on their way back home. And uh, that story of the Jewish people is found in every synagogue so that if you divorce your Jewish identity from that, from the ark pointing towards Jerusalem and to the Torah, which tells your story, and you say that actually this story is fake, it's not yours, it belongs to somebody else, Palestinians say that they're the Canaanites or the Jebusites or the Philistines. Doesn't matter, of course, that the Canaanites and the Jebusites disappeared from the pages of history 3,000 years ago or that the Philistines disappeared 2,700 years ago. 
They are, as Arafat said, the descendants of the Jebusites. And by the way, Rachel, uh, the wife of Jacob, was his grandmother. And the Jews have no relationship whatsoever to any of our patriarchs, patriarchs. So the American Jews who are going in this direction don't recognize that the only place that they'll end up is assimilated and with no Jewish identity. And they will depart from the Jewish people because uh, on just the most basic level, they can't explain why they're Jewish anymore. Because the Palestinian narrative, by erasing Jewish history, by co-opting Jewish history to the Palestinian Arabs, is saying that there's no reason for anybody to be a Jew, certainly not in the diaspora and also not here because we're not really Jews, we're interlopers from Poland or something. So that's, that's a concept that also people are missing and that's why the, the, the cultural appropriation, the, the erasure of our history and its appropriation to the Palestinians by the Palestinians for the purpose of legitimizing their campaign to annihilate the Jewish state and the Jews of the land of Israel is, uh, is the most powerful form of anti-Semitism, I would argue, uh, we've ever seen. Because people don't even understand just what it means anymore. The idea that we're having a testimony before the House last week, and, and we're pleased that this has happened, but that members of the House of Representatives felt it necessary to have a hearing last week about whether or not anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism because the Biden administration on Erev Shavuot uh, uh, announced a strategy for fighting anti-Semitism that couldn't define the term. And they said, well, on the one hand, this, this definition of contemporary anti-Semitism says that anti-Zionism is a form of anti-Semitism. And this, for, this definition of anti-Semitism, which was put out by anti-Zionist Jews, uh, says that anti-Zionism isn't a form of anti-Semitism, but whatever it happens to be, we're against anti-Semitism. We have this whole wonderful strategy for fighting it. And by the way, one of the implementing agencies is a Muslim Brotherhood front organization called the Council on American Islamic Relations. Did you catch that? Anyway, <laughs> the point is that, you know, if the very concept that you can say that erasing Jewish history that appropriating Jewish history to a people with no history in this land, and then saying that the Jews have no right to this land, and that the country itself that we established here is illegitimate, and that it can only exist at the pleasure of people who have just erased us from the pages of history, is, is a form of anti-Semitism. I mean, I mean, like, if you cannot recognize that, then you have embraced uh, a narrative that is more hostile to Jews even than the Nazi narrative that all Jews have to die because not only does it seek the annihilation of the Jewish people in Israel through war and abroad through confusion and seizing the very rationale for them remaining Jews, um, you're saying that Anybody who opposes what you're doing is immoral and he's a colonialist and an imperialist and a racist. So this is, I mean, this is, this is, this is the truth about the, the, the narrative and we see it again with all of the official policies of the Palestinian Authority. We see it in their curriculum in the schools and we see it everywhere else. And when we look at attacks against Jews throughout the world, whether again, it's in London or Paris, whether it's in Uruguay, or in San Francisco or New York, almost, uh, obviously, there are Nazis uh, around who'd be happy to kill Jews, as we saw in Pittsburgh, as we saw in other places, we saw in San Diego, and we see it in many places, but we also see that the rallying call increasingly of Jew haters when they attack Jews physically throughout the world is Palestine. They say that, that, that we oppressing the Palestinians, we've seized their land, the Jew sitting at a cafe in, in Los Angeles seized Palestinian land, and of course he did, because if he goes to synagogue and his ark is pointing to Jerusalem, then he's rejecting the legitimacy of their cultural appropriation and erasure of Jewish history. So obviously he's complicit, because Judaism itself is complicit with Zionism, because Judaism is Zionism. So, you know, I, I, I congratulate Avi for this conference because I think that the, 
better we understand the existential nature of the Palestinian war against Israel and what it signifies for Jews in Israel and throughout the world, the more able we will be going forward to fight it. Because, you know, as Melanie said, right now we basically, you know, we're not even showing up to war, not to mention winning it. So I think in this war of ideas, we have to start with the basic idea, which is that the land of Israel screams out the truth in every centimeter which is that this is the land of the Jewish people and we are the Jewish people. So with that in mind, I thank you all for coming and Before I let Caroline go, and we'll take a break, hold on one second. Before I let Caroline go, I will do something very unconventional for our conference. First of all, I just want to say a very special thank you because you really made every effort to be here tonight even though you were supposed to but then you had other con conflicts that were then taking you away and you came anyway. So a real hakaratato, thank you very much. And for the unconventional thing, we're going to take a selfie, everybody. This, this, is, is, Avi. this is Avi Abel of the Pulse of Israel. Ready? So everyone smile. Done. All right, everyone, 10 minute break, bathroom break. We're starting again in 10 minutes. And just like we started at 6 on time, we're starting at 10 minutes on time.
All right, everybody, start getting your seats. Start telling everyone to start getting their seats. We're getting going, because again, we just got started. Yeah, yeah, I will, uh, I will start uh, another minute as people start getting themselves together. But we really put together a fabulous, fabulous uh, program of stars, young and young at heart. How's it going? As everyone's coming back in uh, from the break, I just want to say thank you, because uh, we scheduled a, a really uh, packed program, and it's a, it's a full evening, and it's understood that not everyone can stay. So to everyone who is staying, thank you very, very much, both if you're staying here physically, or if you're staying and watching online. But uh, every, every participant has so much to give over to all of us that it's really, really needed in order that we all move forward empowered uh, to be able to together change the conversation to really, really save lives from this reality we're talking about that's being ignored. All right, I'm going to start as people start uh, coming back in. I want to build upon the insanity of our situation that Caroline so eloquently was explaining to us and take it a step further. And this is something that I like to say and anyone who follows my programs probably hears me say it every once in a while. And listen closely because this is a truth that gets little attention, which is a really, really big shame. Because it puts into perspective everything we're talking about. We, the Jewish people, even us right-wing settler extremists who are really just peace-loving people, just wanting to be Jews living in our homeland. Nothing extreme about us. We're just normal people who want to live in our homeland and protect ourselves. Even us, we want to live in peace, and we have nothing against any of our Arab Muslim neighbors. We just believe it's totally insane that there's silence about a Jew-hating agenda that's allowing them to continuously kill us. But what's the truth that hardly gets mentioned? Israel, and again, anyone correct me if I'm wrong, Israel is the one country in the Middle East, if not the only country, one of the only countries, where all Arab Muslims, whether Shiite, Sunni, atheist, female, gay, they can all live with freedom and equality under the Jewish state of Israel. They can't do that in any other Arab Muslim country in the Middle East. They can't. You're in a Sunni country, you're in danger from the, from the, from the Shiites. You, the Shiites are in danger from the Sunnis. You're in a Shiite country, you're in danger from the, the, the Shiites. You're a woman, you don't have freedom and equality like 
Arab Muslim women have in Israel? Israel is the only place. Not in Gaza, not in Judea and Samaria, under the Palestinian Authority, unfortunately, today. This is a truth about Israel and the, uh, that, that we should be screaming at the top of the rooftops. And I like to say that the most blessed Arab Muslim in the Middle East are Arab Muslim Israeli citizens. And it's a simple truth. And again, why aren't our leaders talking about this in order to very simply get rid of the lies and propaganda that, me, that, that is used in order to delegitimize us? And it's not used. And this is something that I believe Jewish organizations, Jewish leaders, Israeli leaders should be talking more of, and they hardly talk about it at all, and it's just crazy. Right now, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Colonel Richard Kemp. Richard Kemp was a British Army commander and head of the International Terrorism Intelligence Team. In the UK Prime Minister's office, he was also chairman of the Cobra Intelligence Group, during his military service, he fought in Northern Ireland, Afghanistan, Iraq, and the Balkans. He is a strategic consultant, best-selling author, and commentator on defense, security, terrorism, and intelligence in the press and broadcast media. He has defended Israel on numerous occasions at the UN and campaigns against anti-Semitism in Britain, the US, and elsewhere. And I am blessed to also call Colonel Richard Kemp a friend. And I do believe that Colonel Kemp is one of our modern heroes for being, a not, for being a human being and a non-Jewish human being, does, not Israeli, not a Jew, and still uses his powerful voice to stand up for the truth about Israel and the Jewish people on the world stage. Unfortunately, last minute, Colonel Kemp was invited to an important meeting this evening, and he instead sent me this video to share with all of you instead, but he did apologize profusely because he really, really wanted to be here talking to all of you personally. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to apologize for having to pull out of this conference at the last minute. I very much wanted to be here, but unfortunately cannot join you due to matters outside of my control. I'd like to thank Abby and Pulse of Israel for holding this conference to tackle anti-Semitism, a very important issue for Israel, the Jewish people, and the world. Today's anti-Semitism and its proxy anti-Zionism can only be fought effectively if its primary cause is recognized, understood, and named. And no matter how much people want to deny it, that primary cause is the Palestinian National Movement, which is dedicated to the destruction of Israel and also its intersection with other movements that seek to subvert Western values. Lies, distortion and perversion of history are their main weapons and they gain traction every single day. The advance of artificial intelligence is going to multiply their destructive effectiveness. And I would suggest you might wish to consider how this can be countered, and indeed how AI can be used to better fight against anti-Semitism. Until we can find an effective way of undermining the false narrative of the Palestinian national movement. There is no hope of seriously tackling anti-Semitic hate. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you have a successful conference. As anyone who has ever heard Colonel Kemp, and especially tonight, knows, he gets it. He gets it, and I'm so thankful for him for his message that he's sharing with us tonight to all of us. And my blessing, one, is that he continues to use his, God continues to give him the strength to use his voice to make as big of a difference as possible, and that our leaders can be inspired by him standing up for us, even though he, in a sense, does not have skin in the game. I want our leaders, who do have skin in the game, 
to learn from Colonel Kemp and voice that as well. Thankfully, thankfully, Colonel Kemp is not the only non-Jewish leader who gets it and is vocal and active in trying to help us. And thanks to my work with uh, Ruth Lieberman and Sarah Pillay and the Yes Israel Project, we have many friends in Washington who also get it, and I want to share one of them with you right now. All right, here in D.C. with one of my favorite counterparts, Andy Barr, a real gem of a human being. It was amazing seeing you again here in Washington and all of your support, especially I know there's an urban bill down right now. I think they're a co-sponsor of? Yeah. And that's so important to end the funding towards education ahead of the least resilient nation in history to kill, to kill Jews. And it's the enforcement of Taylor Force is so important. That's right. And in fact, we brought this up when we were in Ramallah with the PA, and we said uh, this is not just uh, a, an executive branch issue. For Congress, uh, we don't want any funds to go uh, into the West Bank to the PA as long as there is a policy of paying terrorists. Uh, we want to protect American taxpayers from funding terrorists. 100%. I know you're running counter to the bar. Yeah. All right. I'm going to say thank you very much. So crazy day on Congress today, and I had a chance to meet and talk with Congressman Barr, a real true friend of the Jewish people in the state of Israel, <laughs> as he was running from one committee meeting to another committee meeting here <laughs> in the Capitol. And um, I just want to end this video segment, this Pulse of Israel video segment, in just reinforcing the message of focusing how blessed we are. Each and every one of you. I mean, personally, I'm, I'm standing here in front of the capital of the free moving world with its ups and downs, meeting with congressmen and senators who are at the center of making decisions that impact all of us. And I'm blessed. I'm blessed to be able uh, to be here and, and, and meet with these people every once in a while. First time since 2019 because of COVID. But I just want to say thank you to God. Thank you for allowing me to work with wonderful people and Ruth Lieberman and Sarah Pillay and the Yes Israel Project, which is about strengthening the U.S. Israel strategic relationship and, and, and making relationships and educating congressmen and senators about the truth regarding Israel and the Jewish people so that they're not swayed by the headlines, which is 99.9% .9 wrong and libelous uh, against Israel and the Jewish people. So thank you, God. And, and you always be always be appreciative of everything. And but even more, I thank God that I live in Israel, that I'm raising my children in Israel, that the Jewish people are alive and well in the true state of Israel, alive and well with all the ups and downs and all the challenges that we have plenty, both external and internal. But with it all, never to go to baby after the bathwater. I am so blessed. We are also blessed. Start your day saying thank you every single day and throughout the day. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, off to the next meeting. So thankfully, Congressman Barr is not the only one, and we have other friends there, and thankfully they are standing up and trying their best to, stay the, to say this truth, to tell the American people and the American administration that American money should not be given to the Palestinian Authority because it supports killing Jews. Now, I want to tell you one other story before we get to the very important panel discussion with our next generation of Jewish leaders who are online, literally, on the fight, on the front line for all of us. I don't only have the uh, privilege of interviewing congressmen and senators and Israeli leaders and Jewish leaders, I also had the, uh, the privilege of interviewing a terrorist. Yes, a terrorist. Um, he was brought up in Shechem, in Nablus, um, I think Shechem, or Janin, and uh, he was raised as a child to kill Jews. Uh, and one day he went out on his mission together with his, the other terrorists to go shoot at Israeli soldiers, and thankfully they were caught. So he was imprisoned in an Israeli jail. He used his time in jail to study the Quran 
And in a sense, he on his own realized that he was brainwashed all of his life. He was a Fatah terrorist, right? Fatah is the Palestinian Authority, the ruling party of the Palestinian Authority. Arafat was Fatah. Abbas was Fat is Fatah. And that he was raised all his life that he's supposed to kill Jews. Um, and due to his own self-education, he realized, oh my God, I've been brainwashed. I'm not, I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want this. This is not what I want to do. So when he was finally released from Israeli prison, thankfully he did not succeed in killing anyone, and I don't, I don't know how many years he was in prison, he went back to his family in uh, either Nablus or Janin, Shechem or Janin, and he started working to make money by helping other Arabs in Judea and Samaria sneak into Israel for illegally to work. Um, and on one of those days that he was sneaking in people to work, he saw that one of the people that was sneaking in in his group was a suicide bomber. And he alerted the IDF soldiers to the terrorist that was about to commit a, a, an attack. And because of him, the IDF soldiers stopped the terrorists, lives were saved, um, and he received a badge of honor from the state of Israel for saving Jewish lives. And here too, in this story, the state of Israel, to protect his life, uh, took him and his wife, and I think eight, nine, or 10 kids, I think at the time, into Israel and gave them Israeli citizenship, and I think they live up now in Haifa. Um, and this is an interview that can be viewed on, uh, on our website, pulseofisrael.com. I think just search for terrorists. It should be one of the videos that come up. So in my interview with him, he says very, very clearly, the Palestinian Authority is oppressing his people. And he goes around the world. He was asking me for contacts of Israeli politicians and politicians around the world to talk to, to tell them to stop giving money to the Palestinian Authority. This is an ex-terrorist. Right? He wants to tell the world, stop giving money. They teach us to kill Jews, and they oppress me and my family and my people. So here we have the message to the... the the enlightened leaders of the Western world who say that they care about human rights, well, they're not helping human rights of anyone, definitely not Jews, and not even the Arabs they supposedly care about or are trying to care about. So this and the other story are two stories that are going to be written up in a book that I'm in the process of writing uh, with many stories to tell the truth, the politically incorrect truth and inspiration about our story, the Jewish people here in the land of Israel. You will be hearing about that book within the next few months, please God, and you can all order it. Finally, I want to introduce our panel discussion, and then we have our keynote speaker afterwards, so don't go anywhere. Ido Danielle will be leading this panel discussion. Ido is a digital media expert, currently serves as the Senior Director for Digital Strategy at Israel's Ministry of Diaspora Affairs and Combating Anti-Semitism. Up until recently, Ido served as Senior Director for Digital Partnerships and Influencer Outreach at Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I have the privilege of calling Ido a friend, as well as a colleague, uh, connected with the unbelievable work behind the scenes that Ido has been doing for Israel and the Jewish people behind the spotlight. Ido is leading the Israeli government's efforts fighting delegitimization of Israel in the digital sphere, revealing the connection between BDS organizations and anti-Semitism and exposing their ties and terrorist groups. Ido is the founder of the award-winning digital network of pro-Israel digital activists and Israel's influencer dream team, which their members have more than 50 million followers around the world. He has a master's in diplomacy studies from Tel Aviv University and was a fellow at the USC Summer Institute for Public Diplomacy. Ido, can you please come up as I... And introduce everybody else. Please, everyone. Together with Ido on the panel discussion, we have Yirmiyahu Danzig, an Israeli Jewish rights and racial justice activist specializing in Jewish diversity, history, and identity. After receiving his BA in Homeland Security and Public Diplomacy from the IDC Herzliya and studying at Machon Meir Yeshiva, he served as a squad commander in Magav, the Israeli border police, in a unit responsible for counterterrorism operations and peacekeeping in the old city of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. Inspired by the lives of his ancestors, those who lived in the old city of Jerusalem for generations, and those who survived the sugar, plant the sugar plantations of the Caribbean, Yirmiyahu is a dedicator 
educator, activist. He regularly speaks at joint Israeli-Palestinian events with the purpose of navigating competing narratives and aspirations. He lectures Israeli and diaspora audiences on Jewish identity, diversity, racism, and anti-Semitism. Yirmiyahu also produces educational content that can be seen on the Instagram at that Semite. He speaks Hebrew, English, Arabic, Yiddish, and Guyanese Creole. Did I say that correctly? He is currently a digital educator for Jewish Unpacked. Everyone, please welcome Yirmiyahu Danzig. All right, to introduce the next uh, panelist, we had a little video. The Palestinian society is plagued with anti-Semitism. We see it all over. We see it in the Palestinian education system, we see it in their leadership, we see it in their media, and we see it on the streets. Every time there's a terror attack and Jews get killed or injured, we see hundreds of people taken into the streets, celebrating, handing out candy and sweets. Tonight, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza encouraged all the people to go up on the roofs and cheer as they shoot rockets at Israeli civilians. And this isn't to say that all Palestinians are bad and anti-Semitic. I don't even know if most of them are, but the fact that anti-Semitism, Jew hatred, is so widespread and so intense that people are actually happy to see Jews die, to see Jews targeted by bombs. It tells us, well, this is what happens when a society is led by a fascist, anti-Semitic leadership. And as much as people don't want to admit it, much like how back in Nazi Germany, the education system, the media, the leadership was all aimed towards one thing, Jew hatred. This is what we see in the Palestinian society and those who lead it. Hands of applause for Adiel Cohen. Please come up, Adiel. Adiel is a young Jewish activist and content creator who focuses on issues like fighting anti-Semitism online, empowering the younger generation of Jews worldwide, and building bridges between Israel and the Arab world. His Instagram account, Adiel of Israel, has close to 30,000 followers and counting, and thankfully they see content like this, which is so needed. And finally, our final panelist, Nina Rab. Born and raised in Chicago, Nina's commitment to the Jewish people has been ingrained since childhood as the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors with rich family history in Israel. Nina is a graduate of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign where she studied finance and became a pillar of the Jewish community, leading pro-Israel initiatives and fighting against three BDS resolutions, which I believe is not so simple nowadays on college campuses in the United States. While at Illinois, Nina was the president of the Illinois Tamid chapter, where she fostered economic ties between U.S. college students and Israel. Nina's previous professional endeavors include working with an Israeli-based electric aviation startup, actively contributing to their successful Series A funding round, and serving at Deloitte in Tel Aviv, where she worked on their public sector strategy consulting team and the Deloitte, Deloitte Catalyst team. Today, Nina divides her time between New York and Israel, channeling her efforts in uplifting Israel through business ventures as the founder and CEO of Lion Run Consulting, which works to help Israel and U.S. companies prepare for capital raising. She is an avid advocate for fostering strong ties between the U.S. and Israeli startup ecosystems and is dedicated to inspiring young Jewish professionals to embrace their entrepreneurial potential. Nina's compelling story as the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors and her experiences in combating anti-Semitism on the ground in the U.S. exemplifies the young leadership that is necessary to combat the rising anti-Semitism. And an additional thing that is not yet in Nina's bio, but I just learned tonight, she happens to be a student of my father's. Nina Rab, please come on up. I think the first thing that the moderator can do is allowing uh, the members of the discussion, his discussion panel to speak. So I will just say a few words um, and then uh, we will dive into our discussion panel. Um, but first of all, uh, the Ministry of Diaspora Affairs and Combating Antisemitism, uh, besides of being in charge of um, the Israeli government's relations with the Jewish communities, out there, it's also monitoring anti-Semitism uh, uh, and mostly anti-Semitism online, what happens around the world. Um, 
you've seen some of the work of uh, Itamar Marcus. I won't. Uh, you've seen uh, Abbas's uh, remarks and so on. Uh, I won't mention it again, but I will say this. I think the key of understanding, I believe my uh, distinguished uh, guests in my discussion panel will agree that the key of understanding um, the Palestinian incitement or uh, Arabic language incitement is basically realizing that it's all combined together, the classic slash modern slash new antisemitism as we all know it, the incitement for terrorism, for killing of Jews and Israelis and terrorist attacks, um, and, um, and of course delegitimization of Israel, the, uh, uh, countering the very existence of the state of Israel. So it's all combined together. And only in the past uh, three months, April, May, May, June, uh, we've seen it with multiple cases, and I believe that anti-Semitic incidents, terrorism, of course, the, the, the digital sphere and, and what's happening uh, um, in the real world are combined. And Mahmoud Abbas's speech in the UN, the uh, terror attacks, Operation Shield and Arrow, um, what happened around the flag parade in Jerusalem, um, the uh, violent events, the terrorist attacks in Judea and Samaria, um, um, the attack against the synagogue in uh, Jerba, in Tunisia, um, the attack against Israeli cho soldiers in the Israel-Egyptian border, it's all combined together. And we've seen it online, the incitement that was before and followed it, um, and of course the actual incidents that fuel it, I want to touch one thing um, in particular, and that is the uh, incident in the Egyptian-Israeli border that claimed the lives uh, of three Israeli soldiers uh, just recently. Um, the incident provoked uh, back then widespread reactions in Arab social media and of course in Egypt. The perpetrator was widely acclaimed as a hero, like many others uh, who uh, made terror attacks against Israelis and Jews. Um, the supporters pray the courage of this lone soldier, this lone wolf who killed three soldiers. They encourage more violent acts by claiming that if one soldier killed three, more soldiers could kill more. And they all agree that the incident sends a message that the Egyptian and the Arab peoples reject normalization. That was something that we monitored widely. Again, as I said, anti-Semitism, incitement, terrorism, and delegitimization of the very existence of the state of Israel, all combined together. So um, we'll move uh, uh, directly to, the, to our discussion panel. Um, how much time do we have, Avi? Okay. So plenty of time. <laughs> um, at the end, I want to start with you. Um, recently, we managed to salvage back your TikTok account. Do you want to do you want to tell us more about it? Yeah, of course. Um, so I've been uh, active on social media uh, for around three years now. My first platform was, uh, was TikTok, and that went to it. So it's a long story. I was really about to say that it's not any of this, but I'm here now. Um, and most of my content was really uh, put out there. Uh, it was content about, you know, content about Israel, uh, the Jewish people, Jewish culture, Jewish identity, as well as uh, Israel and the Arab world uh, relations. And Around a month ago, uh, I made a video that it was a, a video response to a neo-Nazi, an American neo-Nazi, uh, not anti-Zionist, not anything, uh, far excellent neo-Nazi, uh, that claimed that Jews receive envelopes full of all sorts of, uh, I don't know, uh, 
real estate and weird, uh, some weird cl claims. I made a video saying, hey, uh, the only thing we receive for our work is a whole bag of a, a candy uh, thrown at us. And I got mass reported, and within a day, my account just got taken down, just like that. Um, no explanation, I tried to appeal, uh, it didn't work, and at some point, I, I said, okay, let's just en enjoy my time off. Your vacation. Um, my, my vacation, you know, my vacation <laughs> off TikTok. Yeah. Uh, it's a very toxic platform, so I, I really needed that. Um, and then at some point, I, I started feeling like, okay, something is not okay. My appeals are not being received. I, all I did was calling out neo-Nazism. And the, it, it, made, it made me think how much power this tiny, we think, tiny lobby of, of neo-Nazis that that guy had. Um, I, I, I kind of think that it's not too much, it's not uh, too powerful, but there it is, it just took off a whole account talking about Israel, talking about Jewish identity uh, in a very, very positive way. And thanks to uh, Ido and a lot of other people who also contributed to uh, the effort, we got the account back. Right. Uh, By the way, they said that um, it's not about them mass reporting you, because the, 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 the the language you engage with or something. What's with the microphone? No. Um, they said, uh, when I heard back from Tico, they said that um, it's about uh, you engaging in debates, like, but uh, sometimes they feel that debates are uh, hate speech because they are debates. Um, so you need to be careful with with TikTok. I do not have much time uh, to speak about all the regulation and all, all of this, uh, but I have to say that uh, TikTok is a, a, a large, I mean, I mean, very important stage, um, and, um, and and Angel is doing great over there. Um, it's your main platform, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, I think that I, I mean, my service as a civil servant is to allow you to speak up and not get your uh, account blocked. So I'm, I'm happy we, we, we did it. Um, in the album, um, you have a unique voice on this platform as well. Um, and I don't think many of the audience know it. So I want you to please share some of it. Your, uh, uh, your orthodox believer Jew speaks in Arabic, and you make everybody on TikTok nuts. So please, please explain how you started. Well, I think you uh, encapsulated the, the paradox right there. Right? The Orthodox believing Jew walking around with a kippah, uh, sometimes in Palestinian villages in Judea and Samaria, often in uh, the eastern parts of Jerusalem where Jews don't often uh, walk, and then addressing them specifically. Uh, and purposefully in Arabic, and using sometimes their own language uh, against them. Uh, but first and foremost, from the angle of wanting to teach, because just to I think, demonstrate the power of TikTok, not just TikTok, but especially TikTok, um, in 2020 surveys, most surveys indicated that Arab Israelis had the highest level of identification with Israeli identity, perhaps in the history of the state. Far more Arab citizens of Israel identifying with the term Arab Israeli as opposed to Palestinian. Yet, the year after that, in May of 2021, I'm sure like all of us are familiar, we saw unprecedented violence, not only in the Palestinian sector, but also in the Arab Israeli sector. And there's a lot of things that contribute to that. But one thing that most of the experts agree was the influence of TikTok amongst young Arab Israeli and Palestinian. So that's a very stark picture about the power of social media. But I think that we should all also take comfort in the fact that if it can be used to perpetuate and to spread lies and incitement, it can be also used to spread positive information and to enlighten as to what the actual truth of the matter is, both about 
Jewish identity and Palestinian identity and how we can build bridges between the two as impossible as that might seem at this juncture. So a lot of my mission, at least this is how it started and where I'm trying to take it, is about taking a lot of the truths that we discussed today and this evening, translating them not only into literally into the Arabic language, but also into nomenclature that uh, Palestinian Arabs can understand and relate to, and to make it to something that maybe they can reconsider the propaganda that they're receiving and being fed from a daily basis. Because let's face the reality is that a whole planet right now is dealing with a reassessment of what truth actually is, what facts are. Everybody's questioning fake news. So if we're questioning fake news, Palestinians are also questioning fake news. And I have to tell you that on TikTok, more than half of my followers are Palestinian Arabs. And I often get messages saying, we never heard this information in our lives. We, never, we were never exposed to the fact that Jews actually see themselves as more than just a religion. That David Amelech, King David, wasn't just a Muslim, but he was actually the king of Judah. Right? And so this, again, this is just the, the tip of the iceberg. It just shows that we have so much work to do. But if we do it right, if we do it strategically, we can be effective in turning the tide of this war. Thank you very much. Um, and connect the dots uh, between the digital activism that you do and other activism, you know, on the ground, uh, like Nina you know, had. Um, I have to say that I visited a few of the Phil uh, Philadelphia area campuses uh, a few uh, a few years ago. I spoke with students over there. Um, they called BDS resolutions like you did. Um, uh, the the hard thing for them to really um, really connect to the essence, I think, of anti-Semitism behind the scenes. Um, many of them told me that BDS resolutions uh, are often being presented in student halls and so on during Jewish holidays. So Jewish, the Jewish students are not on campus during Passover, for example, they're back home. And then BDS resolutions are being uh, uh, promoted on campus. Um, the incitement of social media, what's happening on campuses, how do you think it impacts these resolutions? Um, how did you guys fight it? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I guess to start off, um, I'll, to give you guys a better idea, um, I'm going to paint the picture of what my freshman year at the University of Illinois looked like. I walked on the campus, it's the first week of school, and there's something called Quad, they were all the organizations set up their, their uh, booths. And that's where I was immediately introduced to an organization called Students for Justice in Palestine as they were sitting in our quad, holding up Israeli flags with blood, hand, bloody handprints painted all over it uh, that, that spelled out Nazis in red paint all over the, um, the flags. And my brother, who was just one year older than me, he was uh, also at the University of Illinois. That's when we both knew uh, we had our work cut out for us. Which is interesting because most students would probably react the opposite and react in fear and then want to hide their own Jewish identity rather than be proactive and want to fight against it. But since you know, coming from Holocaust survivor grandparents and still with strong Jewish values while we grew up, that was, it was immediate instinct to want to do something about it. Just like you said, how uh, SJP would try to uh, push a resolution around the Hadim. That's exactly what happened my freshman year. Um, just two weeks later, on Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, right following after, uh, we get, um, it was a, a mass mail or something set, sent out saying that there is a resolution trying to be passed in our student government that anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitic. And since my brother had seen something similar the year before, we knew exactly what that meant. That meant that they were trying to pass this resolution so then they can then, it would be okay for, to pass BDS uh, later on. Um, because anti-Zionism is, uh, is not anti-Semitic, then it's okay to pass, to pass BDS, it's not anti-Semitic. Um, so 
my brother and I decided to, we knew that the student government was already illegitimate because it was packed with, pe with uh, people from Students for Justice in, Mal in Palestine. So no matter how much the Jewish students would try to fight against it, it wouldn't have made a difference. Uh, we could vote on it, we could do speeches, whatever. So we decided instead we're going to be proactive and we're going to um, assemble a walkout. So the UN General Assembly, so it's an automatic thing. Yes, exactly, exactly. So we gathered over 500 Jewish students and we went to the, to the votes or the meeting and it was the biggest turnout probably that ever happened at the University of Illinois. And right when they were allowed to vote, everyone walked out. And we were trying to prove a point that like it was going to still pass even though you know, there was no Jewish representation. And as everyone was walking out, um, there were um, students holding up signs that said uh, Nazis, ethnazis, this, that, that, whatever. Whatever, it still passed. So we knew that in a few months they were going to then come back to try to pass PDS. And that's exactly what happened. And then it was uh, during my speech that I gave, we decided to actually, you know, not take a different approach. And uh, as I was speaking, and you can look it up, you can look, watch the video online, if you look up my name in UIUC Student Government, the video is online. As I was giving my speech, addressing that um, the, the, all the signs that said Nazi, Nazi this, um, and I, I was pretty much saying, like, how can you call me a Nazi, a, a granddaughter of Holocaust survivors, and how can you define what anti-Semitism is uh, to me? and to Jews, all the Jews that were, the 500 Jews that were sitting in that room. And as I was saying it, one, a student from uh, SJP stood up and he called me a Nazi in front of all 500 students in front of the, the administration. It was on video, you can go see it. But the point is that, that this just embodies the, the ingrained anti-Semitism in students on college campuses. And it's not that every, every Jewish student has the will within them or the confidence to, to fight against it. And it's really sad. And that's why, you know, um, my brother and I, we, we, we take the approach to be proactive as much as possible and try to portray um, Israel in the, you know, as your know, representation and a positive light. Um, and yeah, that's just, you know, now we have an aliyah in the army, and here we are today. But yeah, that just it gives you, a, paints a little bit of a picture. And there's many, many, many other stories I can go into, but uh, yeah. I'm struggling with something, because what you say, they called me a Nazi in front of, you know, the entire the administration was there, the, the, the professors and everybody, the entire students was called on stage. No one is being, I mean, it was a broad daylight, right? Um, people also see what Father Watch is doing, what Itamar Marcos is posting, what the Israeli government ministries is posting, Hebrew posts and so on. People see social media, people see what's happening on Instagram and, and on TikTok. And I'm always struggling with the question, do people still listen? Do people see it? See someone is calling you a granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor, a Nazi, people seeing the, the vulgar incitement that uh, children are being told in the Palestinian Authority and so on. Do people listen? Do you guys think, this is my question to you, you managed to persuade people, you managed to move something with your activism. Is it ha still happening or are we in a age or a sphere that no one listens anymore? Um, I would say two things. One, I think there isn't, we are kind of in an age of uh, where people are apathetic to these types of things. However, I will say there's different types of audiences to target when combating anti-Semitism or trying to teach. Um, and you know, you have those audiences that are already so, so far gone, there's no way that you are going to convince them of anything else. And it's almost like a wasted breath. But the people, I think that, and same with you guys, like, that we're really trying to target is the people that are maybe uneducated and they just don't know. And 
by teaching and trying to connect with them will sway them in one way or another. And if you're that, like, that voice, that light towards them um, that shows you know, that empathy but, but still teaching them is what, what I think really can make a difference. And I'll give an example on campus. To, to be more proactive and instead of being reactive, um, I did an event with our Israeli Council General with our business school where we all about the Star of Nation and Israel and highlighting the, the successes of Israel coming from a, a perspective of strength. And we actually had a huge turnout and the, the, the dean of our business school was uh, also spoke. It was just very, very, um, I think, impactful event because it showed this strong alliance with Israel from a positive perspective. And there was a huge turnout of students that really just wanted to learn, and business students who really had no idea of like, the successes of, of the Israeli ecosystem and how it impacts the world. And so many students came up to me afterwards, and they said, wow, I had no idea. They had no idea about all these technologies that they, that they use on an energy basis come from Israel, and now they want to learn more, and now they want to go on a trip to Israel and whatnot. So by targeting kind of that middle group of people who just simply don't know and are a little bit more open-minded, even though maybe they have some preconceptions from what was originally taught to them, is what's most effective. And yet, I know the people listen to you. Yeah. Sometimes I get a, on my topic of fear, there's a guy called Dr. Palestine. I don't think he's a real doctor. But yeah, is, is he around anymore? I don't know. But this one time, I saw his live feed, and the caption said, Please tell Adiel Cohen I want to speak with him, and I'm here on the live. It was like two hours waiting for him to speak with him online because he had questions. Wow, so, yeah. yeah. That's like 2021 news. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I definitely resonate with that. I want to add on top of that, um, that in addition to who we tell our story to, there's also um, this thing of how we tell our story and what exactly we tell. So we all know the classic, you know, Hasbara type of uh, arguments, Israel invented cherry tomatoes and it's the only democracy in the Middle East and all that, all true and all very, very much, uh, you know, valuable. But I think in this day and age, um, people, especially the younger generation, do not care about countries, uh, um, you know, uh, how do you call it, like, uh, it's a game. Achievements, yeah. People don't care about the achievements of the state of Israel. They care about stories, and they care about authentic stories. And unfortunately, the way the, the story of Israel is told, we're the bad guys. And Israel is undoubtedly the, um, you know, not, the Palestinians are the underdog. Israel has the upper hand in this conflict. Um, I think we can all agree on that. But we have the responsibility to tell the story in a way that is more nuanced, in a way that is more real, in a way that is our perspective. And just like you said, we need to target those people who are ignorant, who just don't know, and tell them, listen, okay, forget about cherry tomatoes and USB drive and all that. I'm a Jew. I live here in Israel. I have certain experiences. Um, my family has had certain experiences in the diaspora, and I have a long history of Jews before me who went about their lives in the diaspora looking for, uh, um, not looking, but fighting for their rights, or even not fighting, just living their lives deprived of any rights. Um, and now we're here. And our story begins way before that. Our story begins thousands of years ago, with the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Tell them about who we are. And just like you know, it, it was said here many uh, several times uh, tonight, if people don't know who we are, we cannot expect them to support us, to support our cause, to support Israel. If they only think that we are a religion, what reason would they have to say, oh yeah, sure, give them a country. We need to make sure that people 
understand Jewish peoplehood, that people understand Jewish identity, if we want them to stand for us, if we want them to stand for Israel, if we want them to simply understand our story, and if we don't do that, and if we focus on shallow, artificial things like Israel's achievements, which, as I said, are very much valuable, but we don't talk about the essence of what it means to be a Jew living in Israel after 2,000 years of diaspora. If we don't explain that to them, how would they know? Um, and I see a lot of impact when you actually tell the story. When people are um, simply listening to who you are, to what's your family's story, all of a sudden something clicks. And they realize that, yeah, it's not about whether Israel has the right to exist or not. Israel exists. And they come to terms with that. Of course, there are the people who, uh, who you know, would never accept any compromise, but you know, we, we need to focus on the silent majority. That's about it. And that's important. Um, Irmiel, your uh, digital activism, your activism in general, really engraved in what Adil just said, the Jewish people, your nickname, your, your username, that semi, is really charging. You know, people, you should, you, you, you should see, I mean, um, what you see is what you get. Give me a, an example, and then an example that you think that you made a change, but I also want you to give one advice for the people here that would like to do something about it and don't know how to start. Okay, so first of all, just in case some people miss that, the my name on social media is Dax Semite. And that was born out of direct conversations and confrontations with people that excuse their anti-Semitism by saying, I can't be anti-Semitic because I'm a Semite too. And that's something that's been said on the Palestinian Arab Street and, and a lot of uh, Arabic social media for many, many years and has recently been translated to English and we've heard some people such as uh, the rapper formerly known as Kanye West saying something similar, and so that inspired me to use that uh, name in order to tell the story of my people, to tell the story of the Jewish people. Um, and I think that I want to express this in a way that we can take away something useful from this, beyond all the gems that we just heard. And that's, I think, that one of the main mistakes that many of us make is that we assume that everybody's seeing the same content that we're seeing on social media. We have to understand that fundamentally, all of these platforms are designed to keep you on them as long as possible. And the algorithms know, and they're designed this way, purposefully, that you're likely to spend more time on the platform if you're seeing content that you already are, agree with or are likely to agree with. So for example, in TikTok, a new user downloads the app, opens it, the app doesn't know if you're Jewish or Arab. So what does it do? It'll show you content in Hebrew, and it'll show you content in Arabic. If you quickly swipe up, meaning ignore the content in one language, it'll start giving you more and more of the content of the other language. And so that way it knows this is the type of content this person will see, and that way it gets more and more and more specific. And so what we need to know is that each of us, in telling our story, are influencers, everybody. It doesn't matter if you have two followers, one follower, zero followers, or 50,000 followers. Everybody in their ability to tell the story in their own authentic way has the ability to influence, whether it's in the comment section, whether it's by sharing something, whether it's you know sharing a video of one of ours or something that, that Avi makes, right? You have the ability to have an influence. We have to understand that when we're creating content or, or respond to somebody in the comment section, that we do so in a way that can break through that algorithm. So for example, something that a lot of every Palestinian the, knows. The hook, the famous hook. The hook, right, exactly. So for example, if I want to make uh, a piece of content, and I want Palestinian Arabs to see it. So maybe what I'll do is I'll take a song, a very popular Palestinian Arab national song, and I'll put it in my video, so all of a sudden everybody who likes that song on social media gets that across their screen, and then what they have, unfortunately for that, isn't a spokesman for Hamas or Fatah or one of the other uh, Palestinian anti-Semitic movements. This is a friend now with the flags, right? This yes. is a friend now with the flags, with the song. It's many flags of Arab states, but people, you know, you need to do it several times, and then State of Israel shows. 
if you click on the trend, you'll see all the Israelis that did the one but made, chose Israel as the flag, not Saudi Arabia. Or, it's very funny to see the reactions. And continue. So. No, I, that's a great example, right? The key is being able to utilize this in a way which is sophisticated, which is, it doesn't just start the conversation, actually takes it somewhere. Because for everybody that the screen we come across, or wherever we come across in the comment section, maybe nine out of 10 that will be convinced in their anti-Semitic beliefs and their anti-Israel beliefs. But every once in a while you come across somebody who is open to having their ideas challenged, that has something happen in their mind to cause them to question the powers that be. And that's when we need to come in and fill that void and give them something meaningful. Because eventually that small number turns into entire groups. Right? And so if anybody here has any questions about if we can turn this whole situation around, then I personally think they lack emunah, right? And, and if we're not for emunah, and that's this, this belief that we can radically change our reality, none of this would be possible today. Thank you. At the end? Um, at the end, a word, for, a word of advice for the crowd on activism, how to start. So, I, my main shtick is telling stories. As I said before, I, I can't stress enough how important it is to tell your personal story. Do not um, focus on all of Israel's achievements and all that. Do not talk big, talk small, talk personal. Say who you are. Um, I also want to say that if you don't say who you are, if you don't tell your own story as a Jew on social media, someone else will. And more often than not, it is someone whose intentions are not good. Um, it is, it's this very common trend nowadays. I, I, I see it all the time on social media to tell who the Jewish people are and say, oh no, the Jews are just a religion. Oh no, they have nothing to do with uh, the historic uh, uh, Israelites. People tell our story for us. And this is how I got into content creation. I bought onto TikTok, as you, as Irmia said. Um, in the beginning, you get all these random videos until, as a lot of dancing. Yeah, a lot of like dancing, a lot of like. Not, not anymore. anymore. I have to say that. I, I mean, how many of you use TikTok here in the in our audience or know it? If you can raise your hand. So, so a, a handful. Okay. I, I need to say something about TikTok because I think it's important. TikTok used to be used to be uh, a dancing app. Mostly, it, it is still, but they don't see it, the, the company itself, as a as a dancing app anymore. It's an entertainment, and entertainment is a broad, very very wide and broad uh, term that holds a lot. People learn from TikTok. You have experts there. You have teachers there. You have so much uh, knowledge over there. Um, people like uh, uh, our guests here and many, many others, including the Palestinians, I have to say, to do the same thing for their side. Um, so it's an entertainment app with a lot, a lot of knowledge, politics. Um, this is what TikTok really is nowadays. Yes, Jim. Yeah, so when you first log on to uh, TikTok, you see all sorts of very random videos, very random content up until uh, the, the algorithm catches you know, your interests and, and your likes. And at, at some point, I started receiving more and more videos about Israel. And with the videos about Israel, I started receiving more videos about hating Israel. And every single video, every other video was like, this is uh, the companies that you should boycott because they're complicit in Israeli war crimes. Uh, here's what the IDF did today. And I was like, where are all the Jews? There's like no one here. Why is no one telling our story? And, um, and this is what got me motivated. motivated. I, I understood that if I'm not going to be here on this platform and uh, tell my story through my perspective, through my lens, someone else is going to do it for me. And people have done it for me. And I went after them. And they regretted it. And <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's a must. We have to do it. If we don't do it, other people would, and we don't want that to happen. Download TikTok.
Alright. Nina, briefly, a word of advice for our audience in your perspective on activism. So when I give a, I guess, a piece of advice, I'm kind of saying it to whoever would be the, I guess, the future me, or like when I think about myself when I was on campus, and you know, not, now I'm not there anymore, and so I would hope that, um, you know, that young um, freshman just entering college who may not be so, so confident in their, their knowledge or whatever it is, um, but they feel some, some sort of like burning passion inside of them that, that an instinct that they know that whatever they're seeing is not right. My, my advice to them is to follow that, follow that instinct, because like Ariel said, if you're not the one standing up for yourself and your people, then there's no one else is. And I guess if you have time for one short, small, Okay. Abby's testing me that we need to finish. Right? Yeah, One short small anecdote that kind of pushes that same idea that if you're not going to uh, fight for yourself, that no one will. Um, it was uh, 2021. My family organized a small rally in, our, uh, in the suburbs of Chicago. And it was when there was a flare up in Gaza. And it was just it was a small group of us, maybe 50 to 100 Jews. And um, over 2,000 uh, Arabs showed up and surrounded us. And we had told the police beforehand, just letting you know, there's probably going to be some conflict if you know, something happens or whatever. Just, just be aware, be around us. They, um, we were just giving speeches. We had some people within our, our town as well um, also giving speeches. And pretty much the, what happened was the... 2,000 Arabs surrounded where we were in the middle of our city, um, in the downtown area, and the police ended up telling us that we can't protect you, you have to leave. So if the police can't protect you, and this is in, in one of the uh, best ranked cities in, in the U.S. to raise children, if the police cannot protect you, then who will? And if you're not going to stand up for yourself, then who will? And you know that translates into college campuses. And I think raising your voice about yeah. this incident and make it public, I think that also serves the message exactly. um, on, on, on this issue. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that we have to wrap it up because we could continue uh, for uh, I think a few hours because uh, for me it's very interesting. I want to thank each and every one of you for what you're doing for the state of Israel, really. And,
in three minutes. <laughs> but our guest of honor is uh, Sarah Hadetsny Cohen, and she um, was instrumental two years ago in helping um, helping the Jews of blood who were um, persecuted by the Arab uprising, so to speak, and um, brought 500 volunteers to Lud to help uh, protect the Jews because the police and army didn't know what to do, which is a pretty sad state of affairs. And, but, and we're going to see a video on her. But before uh, I formally introduce her, I just wanted to say, uh, uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I have a website to save Western civilization called savethewest.com. Everyone should look at it. And um, uh, saving Western civilization is just a fancy word for saving democracy. Now, I wanted to just mention three minutes on anti-Semitism, since the topic of the day is anti-Semitism. And uh, by the way, there is a definition of anti-Semitism by the IHRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. And they came up uh, about uh, 2016, 2016, with a very good definition. But I'm going to add 10 incremental aspects to the definition of anti-Semitism. Number one, anyone who suggests to Israel that it does something that they wouldn't do if they were the Prime Minister. Number two, any advocate of a two-state solution. Bear in mind that a Palestinian state would get taken over by Iran and the Muslim Brotherhood within five days, and then attack Israel. Number three, any advocate of any Iranian deal. Iran's the number one terror organization in the world. I estimate they have about 400,000 worldwide terrorists. And no terrorist organization ever abides by any agreement that they either sign or just not uh, in agreement to. And bear in mind that Iran is not only anti-Semitic and anti-Christian, they promised to kill everyone in Israel and everyone in America. Death to America, death to Israel. Number four, any advocate of any organization or country affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood, like Hamas, financed by Qatar and Turkey, and any uh, local organizations like CARE, and Students for Justice in Palestine. Number five, any defender of George Soros. Number six, any organization managed or influenced by self-hating Jews. This would include J Street, the New Israel Fund, uh, Facebook, and the Democrat Party. Number seven, any advocate of BDS. Number eight, any advocate of the United Nations or any global organization like the World Economic Forum. Number nine, any opponent of meritocracy. And number 10, any opponent of the rule of law. In particular, in Israel, that would be Torah and the basic law. And in America, it would be the Constitution and Bill of Rights, which were derived from the Torah. So anyone who opposes the rule of law uh, is anti-Semitic uh, by definition. So I just thought that you might uh, enjoy, so to speak, a 10 extra, if you, if you didn't have enough definitions of the anti-Semitism, I thought you might enjoy those extra 10 uh, definitions. So now, let's go into, thank you very much. Um, and, and when I think of another five, I'll come back and give you 15 definitions of the anti-Semitism. Now, I'd like to present the Brave Leadership of Zion Award to Sarah Atsini Cohen, Chairwoman of My Israel. And we have a three minute video coming and then a, uh, a formal presentation of, of her honor. So let's, let's look at some uh, video now.
Zairo, Alta Spar, lavorò per chi ci viene, lavorò per Germania, per chi si vede, 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 per chi
to do what's necessary when those who are supposed to be doing it don't do it. So Sarah is one of those people. So thank you so much, Sarah. And it is our honor to inaugurate our great leadership of Zion Award at the first Pulse of Israel Conference, giving it to you. So thank you so much. Going from one powerful woman to another powerful woman, and we've had a lot of powerful women up here tonight, all right? We are Jews, men and women, and we all have that spirit. I want to introduce to you um, Brooke Goldstein. I don't know how many people here are familiar with her. Brooke is a human rights attorney, author, and award-winning filmmaker, executive director of the Lawfare Project, and a one of her latest books that is about to come out, I think in September 2023, it's called Jew Hatred, A Manual for Mobilization. And Brooke is also on the front line specifically fighting Jew, ha fight, fight Jew hatred, because she started an organization or, or an initiative called End Jew Hatred in the Prism of Human Rights, because that's not being done. Um, so Brooke sent us a video, because she is a broad. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to address your conference. When I graduated law school, I spent two years in and out of Janine, Ramallah, Tutam, and Annapolis. At great personal risk, I secured first-hand interviews with leaders of terrorist organizations, families of suicide bombers, children imprisoned for attempting to blow themselves up, and teachers at terror-run schools. I did so to document the illegal state-sponsored indoctrination and recruitment of innocent Muslim children towards violence. I believe then, and I still believe today, that the recruitment of Muslim children as suicide bombers, child soldiers, and as human shields is a crime against humanity. Not just because it results in violent attacks that kill innocent people, but because it completely destroys the future of so-called Palestinian society. My footage ended up being compiled into a 60-minute documentary film, which won the Audience Choice Award for Best Film at the United Nations Documentary Film Festival. This is also ironic, considering that UNRWA, the United Nations Relief Works Agency, is responsible for hiring teachers of the Hamas payroll and inviting al Qutla al Islamiyah, which is Hamas's youth wing, into classrooms to recruit Muslim children for suicide and homicide attacks. This practice still exists today, and it is the root cause of the conflict. We have a conflict, not a cycle of violence, but we have a conflict in the Middle East because children are being taught and indoctrinated to hate. No child is born with hate in his or her heart. Hatred is taught. We have been screaming this truth, and nobody has been listening. The West funds the Islamist indoctrination machine, and we tolerate it. This can no longer remain the status quo. And we must demand, as Israeli citizens, that the human rights of Muslim children be protected, and that our political leaders give this basic issue the attention it deserves. For the future of our children and theirs is intrinsically linked. Yet Jew hatred is not only being taught in Islamist societies, but it is now being taught in Western universities and colleges, and even in K-12 schools across Canada and the United States. A lot of this has to do with foreign funding coming in from states like Qatar and affecting the so-called progressive, woke curriculum. Before I made Aliyah to Israel, I lived in Brooklyn and literally lived in the center of the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement and activism, but also the street violence that entailed. I saw also how Jews were marching behind people like Linda Sarsour in the hashtag MeToo movement. It's hard to ignore the fact that we are living now in the age of minority rights movements. The Jewish community is the oldest, most persecuted minority community in human history. And while great strides have been made for women's rights, for black rights, for gay rights, and so forth, how come the Jewish community has not received any parity? Why is it that Jew hatred is the only bigotry that's still tolerated in polite society? The only bigotry for which there are no real societal, political, legal, and other consequences. Why is it that Adidas can kick out Kanye West, but then replace him with Bella Hadid, a major Islamist Jew hater? 
Three years ago, I commissioned a paper. We studied the strategies, the tactics, the messaging, the funding, and the organization of the new and old women's rights movements, the black civil rights movements, the end Asian hate movement, the LGBTQIA plus movement, and the Soviet Jewry movement. Following the study, based on what we learned, we launched the End Jew Hatred Movement, the first Jewish civil rights movement in modern times. Did you know there's never been a Jewish civil rights movement in the West? The Zionist movement, which was started 125 years ago by Theodore Herzl, was about getting the Jews out of the diaspora and establishing sovereignty in Israel. The current pro-Israel advocacy movement is also all about securing the state of Israel. But a true civil rights movement is that which demands equality before the law and justice here and now. You do not have to be a Zionist or to advocate for Israel or to move to Israel to demand that your civil rights be protected in the West. And yet that is exactly what's happening. Wholescale civil rights violations against Jews for being Jews. And we are making a mistake when we respond to civil rights issues with pro-Israel advocacy. What we are doing is giving them an affirmative defense to discriminate against us. That is why NGO Hatred is a grassroots movement centered on Jewish liberation from all forms of oppression and discrimination in the West. We work to eliminate Jew hatred from Western culture through peaceful, direct action and education. We organize actions such as protests and other campaigns that ensure real consequences for acts of anti-Semitism. We have chapters all around the world, and I'm proud to say that April 29th has been declared officially in the United States as the day to end Jew hatred by dozens of lawmakers from both sides of the aisle. But what do I mean by ending Jew hatred? Sounds fanciful. Well, hatred is an emotion that you cannot entirely get rid of. You can ensure consequences for acts of anti-Jewish bigotry through the legal system, as well as through real grassroots actions and Jewish unity around strategic results, we can create precedents that deter bad behavior and push this viral disease back into remission where it belongs. Just like you can't say the N-word, just like you can't behave like Harvey Weinstein, so too must you fear consequences for engaging in Jew hatred. I invite you to join the movement and to pre-order my book, And Jew Hatred, a manual for mobilization, which offers pragmatic strategies that work. It shows how we can affect real and lasting change by championing the Jewish cause as a minority rights issue, and how the Jewish community can move from defensive pro-Israel advocacy to offensive civil rights advocacy and affect real and lasting change. Finally, it's my pleasure to announce that we are making a $5,000 grant to anyone at this conference who can organize a group of 20 or more people and start a chapter of the movement and come up with a strategic action that holds Jew haters accountable. For example, if you organize a protest outside the United Nations demanding accountability, we will fund it. We will fund buses that bring people to the protest. We will provide you with pro bono legal support. And we will find other strategic actions and partners to get you out on the street making a real difference by standing up for your rights. No more letter writing campaigns. No more behind closed door negotiations. No more relying on big box organizations to solve our problems for us. The time is now to use the same strategies and tactics that have worked for other minority rights movements, get out on the street, and to organize for ourselves. We have marched for others. The time is now to march for ourselves. I wish you a productive conference, but most of all, I hope that you will learn the tools necessary so that you can mobilize after this conference and engage in real strategic actions that further the Jewish cause as the greatest minority rights issue of our lifetime. Thank you. So now everybody, whether you're here or online, there's your challenge. What's the idea? $5,000 grant to make a difference. And finally, 
I want to invite Elon Carr up to speak with us. You have waited patiently for him, and I want to read his bio correctly. Former United States Special Envoy for Combating Anti-Semitism, with extensive experience as a senior U.S. diplomat, criminal prosecutor, military officer, and community leader, Elon Carr provides an influential voice on key policy matters affecting America and the world today. He has served as a visiting fellow at the Heritage Foundation, a teaching fellow at the University of Southern California, and a member of several for-profit and non-profit boards of directors. In 2019, Mr. Carr was appointed the United States Special Envoy to Monitor and Combat on Anti-Semitism. As the Senior Diplomatic Representative of the United States and the Chief Advisor to the Secretary of State on the subject of anti-Semitism, he directed U.S. policy and programs aimed at combating it. During his tenure, his office was voted by Congress to be given the rank of ambassador. Prior to his federal appointment, Mr. Carr prosecuted violent felony crimes for more than a decade as a deputy district attorney for Los Angeles County. Mr. Carr is an officer in the United States Army Reserve and received multiple awards for his two decades of military service. During his wartime service in Iraq, he led the, he led the first Hanukkah ceremony and regular Jewish services in the former presidential palace of Saddam Hussein in Baghdad. Mr. Carr served as the 71st International President of Alpha Epsilon Pi, a voting member of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, and a member of the National Council of APAC. He currently serves on the International Advisory Council of the Combat Anti-Semitism Movement. I want to thank Mr. Carr for all the work he has done, all the work he's doing, and all the work he will continue to do. Well, thank you so much. Avi, thank you. How lucky are we to have you? Avi, thank you. You are a warrior. And, uh, and look, you've made, uh, you've made Tzedek, Tzedek Tirdof a family business. Your son made a movie. Shira is doing everything. All of the behind the scenes, your parents are here. This is really, uh, it is really a family business. And as it should be for all of us, for all of us, right? Amazing. Um, I'm so honored to share this evening with my dear friends, with Ken and Caroline and Richard and Itamar and Brooke and just uh, Melanie. I mean, Jeff, what an amazing collection of, uh, of real leaders who, uh, who above all that speak with moral clarity. And isn't that what we need so much? But most of all, most of all, I want to thank you. I want to thank our audience, uh, our physical audience and our audience and global audience around the world watching, because you have taken time out of your lives to focus on this most urgent and pressing issue. And it is an urgent and a pressing issue. In 2019, I was appointed by the President of the United States and the Secretary of State to lead America's fight against this ancient yet recurring indefatigable human sickness that is Jew hatred. And I took that appointment at a time of rising anti-Semitism throughout the world. Who could have believed that less than 80 years after the end of humanity's greatest crime, that took two-thirds of the Jews of Europe, that Jew hatred would be rising, even in Europe, and yes, even in the United States, among the most philo-Semitic countries in the history of the world, who could have imagined such a thing? And the question I received so often, including from members of Congress, is how could this be happening? What is going on that we are seeing this tsunami of Jewish? We are in fact seeing anti-Semitism rising from three disparate ideological sources, all of them relevant to this conference that brings us here today. We are seeing anti-Semitism rise from the ideological source of the far right. These are ethnic supremacists who hate everyone unlike themselves, but Jews primarily first on the list. They occupy vile internet chat rooms. They conduct torchlit marches, the likes of which we thought we had long since graduated from. They are the chief source of violence to Jews in the United States. But unlike simply white supremacists, which occupy a very prominent piece of this far-right group, it's not only white supremacy. It is ethnic supremacy from various sources. 
And as we heard Itamar Marcus explain earlier so very well, one of the core features of Palestinian anti-Semitism is exactly that. In fact, Palestinian anti-Semitism borrows an enormous amount of the imagery and the mythology and the hatred that we see on display in the anti-Semitism of the far right, including from white supremacists. That's why when you look at, at the caricatures in Palestinian media, it's reminiscent of Der Sturm. When you look at Palestinian textbook, you see Holocaust in them, a common feature of anti-Semitism of the far right. And when you see what is spoken on Palestinian media, you see that it boils over with ethnic hatred for the other, and of course, again, Jews primarily. We are seeing anti-Semitism rise, and thank you for that, that you've made the connection. Also, from militant Islam. Militant Islam is the main source of violence to the Jews of Western Europe, and it is now a source of violence in the United States. We saw marauding bands ra raging through the streets of New York and Los Angeles. It shocked all of us who know the United States and know American values, and we are seeing it on the rise in America. But militant Islam isn't just a problem in Belgium and Paris and now in Los Angeles and in New York. Militant Islam boils over right here. Again, we heard it earlier said that militant Islam finds a home and a platform in Palestinian anti-Semitism. And the third, the third ideological source of anti-Semitism which we are seeing grow in, in staggering, metastatic fashion throughout the world is what is often called the new anti-Semitism. The anti-Semitism of the radical left. And while Palestinian anti-Semitism borrows the imagery and the language, the vernacular, the lexicon of the far right, it derives enormous support from this new anti-Semitism from the radical left. All three of these ideological sources, disparate camps, we would think, my goodness, the far right, the radical left, militant Islam, these should be ideological camps that hate each other more than they hate anything else on earth. And yet, and yet they find common purpose when it comes to directing their venom against the Jewish people and the state of Israel. That is the milieu and that is the problem. And I could speak about each of these variants of the disease for the next hour. But we didn't come here to dwell on problems. You didn't devote so much of your time to hear how bad things are. And since I'm closing this conference, I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about solutions. Because we are here to talk about solutions. How do we come at this? How do we roll this back? How do we do, as Brooke just so beautifully said, how do we put this disease into the remission where it belongs? I'm going to outline six points. Six simple points. By the way, there's more I could say. But I'm going to narrow it down to just six. Six points that if we truly embrace them and enact them can be, can be game changers for us. First, First, we have to tear down any distinction between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Anti-Zionism doesn't sometimes lead to anti-Semitism. Anti-Zionism doesn't occasionally bleed into anti-Semitism. We have to make the case very clearly that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And that's why the Secretary of State in 2019, my former boss and one of my heroes, Mike Pompeo, stood before 18, yes, he deserves a cross. He deserves a cross. Stood before 18,000 activists at the APAC policy conference that year and said, let me go on the record, by the way, when a member of the cabinet says, let me go on the record, that means fasten your seatbelts. 
You're not getting a slip of the tongue here or a casual off-the-cuff comment. You're getting United States policy. He said, let me go on the record. Anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And that's exactly what it is. Brooke was right in what she just said, that political Zionism started 150 years ago. But let's be very clear. Zionism wasn't created in 1948. Zionism didn't spring out of the first Zionist Congress. Zionism was born in Parashat Lech Lecha. Zionism found its soul when Moses led the Jewish people to the Promised Land. And Zionism was expressed in painful longing by the Babylonian captives who sat on the banks of the rivers of Babylon and said, That is what Zionism is. And if anyone, if anyone seeks to extirpate the connection of the Jewish people to the Jewish homeland, what they are practicing is anti-Semitism, plain and simple, and we have to say it everywhere. Second, we have to double down on Jewish peoplehood. This is something, sadly, that many Jews in the diaspora have forgotten. Yes, we are a religion. Yes, we have a faith in God. Yes, we are a culture. But let's not forget. Let's not forget what we were first. We were first Amisai. And when we take the Torah out of the Alona Kodesh every week, we say, Baruch, Shenatan Torah le'amo Yisrael. We are a people. And by the way, it is by virtue of our peoplehood that we have a right to self-determination in our ancestral homeland. Religions don't get countries. Nations get countries. And if we forget the core essential identity of the Jewish people as an ethno-national people, we do ourselves a grave disservice and we give our enemies the tools by which they can undermine our existence. This is a key point. We have to double down on Jewish peoplehood. We have to not only teach our own people that we are a people, but we have to teach the world that the Jewish people are a people. One of the chief manifestations of the anti-Semitism of the Palestinians and of the radical left it's not only to deny our connection to the Jewish homeland, it is to deny the very character of the Jewish people as a people. To deny Jewish ethnicity. And too many Jews have joined with our enemies in undermining Jewish ethnicity. How can we possibly fight anti-Semitism if we don't know who we are? Second is double down on Jewish peoplehood. Am Yisrael. Am Yisrael Chai. We have to shout it from the rooftops. Third. Third is we have to combat all forms of anti-Semitism, all the ideology. We can't pick and choose. There are three so ideological sources, as I've said. And you know what? If you leave two-thirds or even one-third of the tumor untreated, the patient doesn't do well. So if you're serious about combating the scourge of Jew hatred, you have to fight it no matter what ideological clothing it wears. And that means we not only fight neo-Nazis, we not only fight the, ideo the ideology that spawns these, these hateful terrorists, but we also have to fight the radical Marxist ideology of the left a worldview that gives rise to anti-Semitism as clearly as B follows A. This is something that far too many Jews refuse to do. But it is critically important that we do it. Look, the ideology of the radical left holds that the world is defined through a perpetual struggle of oppressed and oppressor. Who are the oppressors? Well, they're people of privilege. And while white privilege is often cited as an, as an exemplar of privilege, white Jewish privilege is often the most noxious form 
of oppression. In the worldview of the purveyors of this radical ideology. By the way, if you assign people societal roles based on the color of their skin, I, I think there's a very common word for that. Racism. But when you call Jews privileged oppressors purely because they're Jewish and supposedly white no matter the color of their skin, well, there's a word for that too. Anti-Semitism. Let's be clear on what this is. And let's be clear about how pernicious this is and how widespread this is and how mainstream this has become. Too often we try to play the game of the purveyors of this ideology. And so I often hear it said, without, well, did you know the majority of Israel today isn't even white? The majority of, of Israel today is so-called brown people, people who come from the Middle East, Mizrahi Jews. Well, that's true, and we absolutely should point that out. I happen to be very proud of that, being an Iraqi Jew. I'm the son of a refugee from Iraq. But my goodness, does it matter? I mean, if it weren't the case that the majority of Israelis happen to come from, these, from, from Arabic-speaking countries and from Middle, East, or Middle Eastern countries, I should say, not only Arabic-speaking, Middle Eastern countries, that therefore the anti-Semitism of the radical left would be justified? You see, when we play that game, we validate a poisoned ideology that will always lead to the same place. It will always lead to the rejection of the Jewish people as a people and to the rejection of the, of the Jewish cause as being just. And so we've got to fight these ideologies. If an ideology is wrong, we should be embarrassed to stand up and say this is wrong. And that, that's whether it is a right-wing ideology or a left-wing ideology or an Islamist ideology. We have to fight all of it. And if we don't fight all of it, we're not serious about fighting any of it. Fourth, it's been said many times tonight, campuses, campuses, campuses. Our greatest treasure, my friends, is our youth, our young people. If we consign our young people to vile ideological indoctrination, what does that say about us? About our priorities? Fighting anti-Semitism in schools and campuses means, yes, protecting Jewish students from harassment and discrimination, for sure. I was very proud that our administration, the last administration, issued an executive order, President Trump issued an executive order, applying Title VI civil rights protections to Jewish students on campus. I was at the White House when he signed it. He looked at the camera and he said, let me make this very clear. If you are a university and you're promoting the harassment and discrimination of your Jewish students, you are going to lose a lot of money. Don't expect federal funds. I promise you, that, you know how it is. Don't, don't expect, you know how it Look right at the camera, you know how it is. I promise you, every single university president and chancellor in the country heard those warning shots loud and clear. It is critically important to protect Jewish students against harassment and discrimination. But let's be clear, that's not sufficient. That's a start. But we've got to bring balance. We've got to bring balance to our schools. Yes, for anti-Semitism that doesn't rise to the level of harassment and discrimination is protected speech. The First Amendment in the United States is a gift and not a burden. But just because anti-Semitism is protected speech doesn't mean it has to be propagated all around us. And in an academic institution, where kids are supposed to be taught things, isn't it important that there be balance, ideological balance, two sides of the story? We've got to bring balance to our campuses and to our high schools and to our middle schools where anti-Semitism is being propagated. Let me tell you a story. This stuff is real, folks. A student at a premier university, one of the best in the world, in the United States, one of the best in the United States, but really one of the best academic institutions in the world, gave me the answer sheet to his math class. I kept a copy. It says, you know, the derivative of such and such, so and so, the integral of so and so. And then it says, another day in the occupied Palestinian territory, Zionist forces murdering children. And then it goes back to death. 
And the king gave this to me in a voice reflecting utter exhaustion. Said to me, in math class, I can't even escape this? In math class? That's right. The answer is that's right, you can't escape this, even in math class. Because just like the old anti-Semitism, the so-called new anti-Semitism, which isn't very new, is just as maniacal, just as obsessive, just as insane in its focus on its target. And so yes, even in math class, you'll get a good dose of it. That's what's happening. And we shouldn't stand for it. We shouldn't be donating to universities that aren't bringing balance to the campus. We certainly shouldn't be supporting them, and we have to insist that we're going to send our kids to places where they're going to get a real education, not ideological indoctrination. Fifth, we have to suffocate state and semi-state sponsors of anti-Semitism. The world's chief sponsor, not only of terrorism, but of anti-Semitism, is the Islamic Republic of Iraq. It is responsible for a global tsunami of anti-Semitic venom in the Muslim world. And it propagates that hatred in the Arab world as well, largely through Hezbollah, which runs a network of anti-Semitic schools. Now the Islamic Republic of Iran is a chief funder and chief supporter of Palestinian anti-Semitism. Of course, Palestinian anti-Semitism stands on its own, semi-state sponsor of terrorism, the likes of which is shocking and jaw-dropping. In 2016, the Palestinian Authority reissued textbooks that it decided to use in its schools, new editions of textbooks. I mentioned the date because this is before the Trump administration. So nobody can say that it was the strong policies calling out, holding accountable the Palestinians that might have prompted them to go the other way. It's before the Trump administration. 2016, they issued a new edition of their textbooks. The anti-Semitic content was worse than the previous edition. In fact, it was so bad that in Gaza, Hamas decided in Hamas schools to use PA textbooks. And you know how much they like each other. This is what's going on. And every single country that provides money and funding to the Islamic Republic of Iran or to the Palestinian Authority, when they are pushing and promoting and multiplying anti-Semitic propaganda throughout the world is in effect collaborating in the state sponsorship of anti-Semitism. No country should be doing that. That's why the United States cut off the PA. By the way, Sweden was so appalled by Palestinian textbooks that they cut off the PA. We've got to do that now. And we've got to insist that every country in the world refuse to allow the hard-earned tax money of their population to promote anti-Semitism throughout the world. Lastly and finally, look, you can play defense in the fight against Jew hatred, and you have to. When you're facing a, a vicious onslaught, you've got to defend against that onslaught. But let me ask you this. Are wars won without mounting an offense? Can you even win a football game without putting an offensive team on the field? No. If you want to win a strategic victory in the fight against Jew hatred, you've got to also go on the offense and not just defend. Well, how do you go on the offense? How do you go on the offense against what is at its core, what is at its core really a worldview? An idea, I would argue, a spiritual sin. You go on the offense against that by affirmatively, by proactively driving a philo-Semitic narrative that breeds an appreciation of and an understanding of the breathtaking story of the Jewish people, the biblical story 
of the Jews and the values of Judaism that have shaped civilization. You cannot tell the story of France or of Germany or England or Poland or Russia without talking about the Jewish story in these countries. When I was special envoy, I had the great honor of working with our interlocutors in Germany, who in 2019, right for this, 2020 actually, commemorated, was delayed then because of COVID, but commemorated, you ready for this, 1,700 years of Jewish history in Germany. 1,700 years. And so I asked our German interlocutors, what are we doing so that every kid in every classroom, in every city, in the Federal Republic of Germany knows that it's 1,700 years, and not only the number 1,700, but a little bit about the content, about the breathtaking contributions of the Jewish people to Germany. And by the way, vice versa, I asked the question, I said, how many German kids know that the vernacular language of Ashkenazi Judaism from Russia to England is a form of German? Not many was the answer I got. My friends, if we want to get serious against fighting Jew hatred, we have to turn the tables and talk about those values that have, that have undergirded Western civilization. Ken, I think you know a little bit about this, about how we saved the West. Philo-Semitism. In the United States, and I say this, I know we have a global audience, but like there are many Americans in the room. In the United States, for 43 years, every single president of the United States, every year, has declared a period of time for celebrating Jewish contributions to the United States. It used to be Jewish Heritage Week, and since 2016, it's been Jewish American Heritage Month. It's every May. And by the way, May was chosen because of the Olat Samoans. No, no kidding. In fact, when it was Jewish Heritage Week, it would move between April and May, always the week of Yom Haatzmaut. It's a staggering fact. So those of you who are Americans in the room, did you know this? I bet you didn't. I spoke, I spoke all over the United States in front of American audiences, including Jewish leaders, who would look at me with blank stares. Now I'd say, well, okay, well, let me ask you this. Have you heard of Black History Month? Oh, yes, I've heard of Black History Month, of course. You know why? Well, because there's content. Airports are decorated. Netflix has programs. Every school has, has a curriculum that is actually talked about in classroom. But you know, it's not the fault of the president that Jewish American Heritage Month has a little content. It's the fault of the Jewish community. It's our job to inject content into a presidentially declared celebration of our own heritage. And we haven't done too good a job. I'm happy to say that through the efforts of my team, the Special Envoy team when I was in government, and through the efforts of the Combat Anti-Semitism Movement on this board I serve, that is changing in a big way. This year, 130 cities, 130 mayors, have acknowledged Jewish American heritage. Every single Republican governor signed a joint statement acknowledging Jewish American Heritage Month. Many Democratic governors have declared Jewish American Months for their state, sometimes in major events in the city hall. What we're doing is federalizing Jewish American Heritage Month to bring it down to where the rubber meets the road, the place where educational policy is created, where law enforcement training happens. And this a amazing national revolution in the recognition of Jewish American Heritage Month is only the first step. The next step will be curriculum, so that we teach that Jewish peoplehood is real, that the Jewish connection to the Jewish homeland is eternal, that the Jewish capital has been eternal and undivisible since the time of King David. Thank you for opening this conference with that, Avi. That the founding fathers of the United States based the founding of America on Jewish values. That Hebrew was 
actively considered to become the official language of the United States of America because to that extent did the founding fathers of America embrace the Jewish story and the biblical values. We need to be doing this in the United States and in every country around the world. We all need to celebrate Jewish heritage. And then you know what happens? Not only do we strengthen the Jewish people, not only do we remind our non-Jewish friends of their own values at a time when Western values are under attack, but then we get to define the anti-Semites of the world. Instead of only talking about Jew hatred and the Holocaust and allowing the haters of our people to define us, we get to define them as standing against all of those miraculous things that we brought to the world, the decency, the goodness, God, and the global standard of ethics. And then, and then we really get to put this disease into remission. My friends, we have begun the month of Tabuz. And as you know, we are approaching Shvaz of the Tabuz, and then a few weeks later, Tishkata. And we learned that we lost the second temple because of Sinat Chinam. The inability of our own people to come together, embrace our mission, our reason for being in this world, our heritage, our history, and in fact to embrace the godly mission from which we were chosen. It is my prayer that through the work of remarkable leaders like Yuavi, through the work of remarkable leaders, the likes of which we have heard during this, during this conference, and audiences like you who deeply care about this problem and want to make a difference, it is my prayer that in these next few weeks, we will put aside all division. We will put aside those things that force us apart and we will together, together embrace our journey, embrace our connection to our history and our God and our homeland and together build tikkun olam de malchut shaddai and that better world, that better world that our children and grandchildren so richly deserve. Thank you so very much for all that you do. Thank you for having me. And it was an honor to spend today with you. Thank you. I was just telling Elon that I have a close friend, the rabbi, Rabbi Michelle, to close it up with some Torah, but I didn't need it. Elon did a wonderful job of bringing in spirituality, Torah, the, the fact that Zionism, Judaism is Zionism. Rabbi Michelle, you have a hard act to follow. Please, friends, Rabbi, I invited you to come give a, another added spiritual aspect to this evening. Thank you, thank you. Not to worry, everybody, we're ending here. But Avi began with David, so I'll end with David. He was pursued and outnumbered. He was on the run. Internally, the jealous King Saul was terrified of losing his power, and so he chased David all over Judea. And externally, the Philistines, the Amalekites, and others threatened to destroy David and overrun the people of Israel. So he was literally between a rock and a hard place. He was hiding among the rocks and caves of Judea. And yet David found the calmness of spirit to pen the moving words of Psalm 23. That's what he wrote. Psalm 23, when he was running through the hills. He said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Even when I walk in the valley of darkness, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. So the question is, how could David be so calm and so confident when his enemies were closing in on him from all sides? So the reason that David did not lose hope is because he knew with certainty that God had great plans in store for him. You anointed my head with oil, meaning you, God, you anointed me to be king, to lead your people to great heights of holiness and glory. 
And I know that Netzach Israel lo yishaker, the God of Israel does not lie or change his mind. It doesn't look good right now, but your word, God, will come true. We are the people of David. We're facing great challenges from our enemies who plot against us every single day, and from our brothers and sisters who refuse to recognize the seriousness of those threats. And yet, we say, Chag Hashem Machar. Tomorrow shall be a festival for Hashem, for the Lord. As cynical, as false, and as defiled as today might be, tomorrow is ours because it belongs to God. Israel cannot avoid its destiny. We are God's people in God's land, a light unto the nations. We're not meant to be just another small country. We're not the Bulgaria or Belgium of the Middle East. It's here in the Holy Land that we will and must stand and fight as David did, knowing that God is with us, because if Jews fight, the master of the universe fights together with them. But you set a table before me in the presence of my adversaries. Our war is his war. Right? Our victory is his victory. We will be victorious because God is with us. It's not a question. It's only a question of how long it will take. But that day will come. May God bless Israel and all those who stand by her side. And may we soon see the great day when we, the people of David, will no longer have to fight, but will worship God together with all of mankind in the rebuilt temple in Yerushalayim, Yer Kodesh. Amen. Amen. Rabbi Michelle, thank you so much. And I'm not the rabbi, but I'll just add my one line of Torah to end this evening before we sing HaTikva and Anima Amin. We say this every day in our tefillot and our prayers. Hashem oz l'amo yitain. Hashem yivarech et amo v'shalom. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God above, gave us the antidote, the solution to bringing peace to this world. Hashem gives us strength and He will bring us peace. It's by us standing up with strength and that strength is a strength in our identity. It's not just an army. It's our strength of faith, and it's our strength in our Jewish identity. And so long as we stand up for our strength, we don't give in to the political correctness, we don't give in to the culture of the day, we don't give in to the lies, the propaganda, we stand up for ourselves by being proud Jews, regardless of religious level, each as individuals, as families, as communities around the world, especially in Israel, we will have peace. We will overcome. And with that, I want to say thank you to everybody. Thank you to my wife and my family and to all of you. And with that, everyone, please stand up and let's sing that to Ah! Uh.